most welcome to this Mid-Sussex District Council meeting here um, in the Council Chamber on Wednesday the 2nd of November. I would like to welcome everyone, including the public speakers here this evening. I would also like to welcome and introduce two people. One is Jeff Wilde. This is Jeff. He is the Interim Assistant Director, Legal and Democratic Services and Monitoring Officer. I'd also like to welcome Louise Duffield. Um, where is Louise? Hello, Louise. Um, she's the Director of Resources and Organisational Development. You're both most welcome here to join us for the meeting this evening. Thank you. I'm now going to read the fire evacuation notice. Uh, the building fire alarm signal is a continuous two-tone alarm. On hearing the evacuation alarm, please leave the building by the nearest marked exit route. Follow the green signs to the assembly point, large car staff car park opposite the entrance to the building. Anyone who cannot use the stairs will be helped by the officers present and after other people have left. Please do not return to the building until told it is safe to do so by an authorised officer. The whole of the council site is a no smoking area. Filming in the public gallery is permitted, but members must please refrain from filming within the council chamber so as not to distract the meeting. Mobile phones must be switched to silent. Thank you. I'm going to now ask the vice chairman to read the opening prayer. Good evening, everyone. O oh Lord, grant us courage to strive for what is right and good, courtesy to listen to those of different opinion, strengthen us through difficulties and pressures, and guide us in our deliberations so that we may act in the interests of all of our district. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I'm now going to move on to item two, to receive questions from members of the public pursuant to Council Procedure Rule 9. I have two questions. The first question is from Miss Wilcock. Miss Wilcock, would you like to read your question? Chairman, thank you. The question I would like to ask is to clarify how the agents appointed in relation to Clare Hall are to be paid. The BOP report states that this would be a percentage of the capital receipt received by the council. But the council has repeatedly said that Clare Hall would be leased and not sold or disposed of. A capital receipt is the funds received on the disposal of a fixed asset and recorded on the balance sheet, whereas, of course, rental income from a lease is recorded in income accounts. So if Clare Hall is leased, how does a capital receipt arise? And thus, how are the agents to be paid? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the leader to respond, Councillor Jonathan Ash Edwards. Thank you very much, Chairman, and, and thank you, Ms. Wilcock, for um, your question. Um, as everyone will know, the Cabinet in October agreed to continue our ambitious work to seek an investment partner and cultural anchor tenants for a modern, fit for purpose community and cultural venue on the Clare Hall site. Currently, officers are working to commission a specialist broker agent to develop proposals on how to take the two agreed models to the market in order to improve the chances of successful delivery of the project. The question of how an agent would be paid for such work is premature and will clearly be subject to the proper procurement process, but the commissioning work will be reported back to Cabinet publicly in the new year. But I can confirm that the strategic success criteria agreed in July included the commitment that the council will not be selling the site, and that remains the case. Thank you. Ms Wilcock, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Thank you, Chairman. It seems to me with the greatest respect that we're talking about semantics here, because selling is disposing, and if you are proposing to receive a capital receipt from flogging off Clare Hall, that is its disposal, and you are misleading the public by referring it to it as leasing. A long lease for a premium is a disposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you wish to respond or provide a written response? Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to, to respond now. Um, all, all I can say is I completely reject the characterisation uh, of the Council's uh, work or intentions. They're completely untrue. And actually, no decisions have been made because the decision that's been made has been to take forward two options 
to seek an investment partner and cultural anchor tenant and to take that to market. Uh, the commissioning of the agent is still to be done and we haven't taken it to market. So to infer a particular outcome has already been agreed is entirely incorrect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Ms. Weinstein, I believe you're with us, if you'd like to read your question. Sussex Climate Coalition welcomes the commitment of Council to set uh, net zero targets. Many national governments, including our own, have had net zero targets in place for several years, and yet just recently the UN has been warning us that the limited action being taken to reach those targets means that the planet will still warm to a very dangerous level of above 1.5 degrees before 2030, because nothing is happening. We would therefore ask the council why they are not following the example of other local authorities such as Worthing and setting targets for 2030 to ensure that the necessary action is taken urgently. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. I'm going to ask for a response to be provided by the Cabinet Member for Economic Growth and Net Zero, Councillor Hillier. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mrs. Weinstein, for your question. I think everybody in this chamber shares your concerns at the way the climate uh, thing is progressing. Um, however, in direct answer to your question, the Council agrees that action plans are an important tool in the delivery of evidence-based net zero targets. That's why this council recently adopted its sustainable economic strategy and why it is committed to the preparation of a net zero carbon programme to meet the targets we are recommending, the zero, this, recommending this evening. The net zero targets proposed tonight are based on significant evidence prepared by industry experts. You'll note that we are proposing to set a more challenging target for emissions in our direct control as we can actively influence the achievement of this target. However, it is more difficult to set realistic, realistic and achievable targets in respect, respect to the emissions the Council cannot directly control. In this case, we are heavily reliant on the implementation of national legislation and policy to secure reductions in carbon emissions, for example, ensuring our energy supplies are carbon zero. Therefore, we consider it responsible to align our target to the national target, Currently, the national target is to achieve net zero in the UK by 2050. And you are correct, councils have adopted different net zero targets. Unfortunately, not all of them are evidence-based, and in my view, may not be deliverable. In fact, I think I heard that something like 57% of chief executives are not confident they are going to hit their targets, which is worrying for us all. And although Ada and Worthing councils have pledged to be carbon neutral for the emissions they control by 2030, their net zero target for the district and borough is in fact 2045. Without national policy and legislation in place, I have to confess it is difficult to see how this will be achieved. I believe that our work has enabled the council to agree an evidence and pragmatic target which is aligned to national expectations. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. Ms. Weinstein, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, we're very aware, absolutely, about the national government uh, and the difficulty of... Um, it's not just the national government, but it's all the, the local community, local businesses, local individuals. So there's two bits to that. One, what is this council doing to implore the national government to get on with providing the kind of leadership that you require to do what you need to do? And are you uh, working together with the local community? Last time I was here, you were saying you were looking forward to look, looking, uh, working with uh, local green environmental groups to 
get us all meeting those targets, and I wondered how that's going. Councillor Hillier, do you wish to respond? This moment. Thank you. Thank you for the follow-up question. Uh, in terms of national government, I think I am confident that they are fully aware, and I do hear from RMP that in discussions with other countries around the world, they are very admiring of how far we've got. And I don't say that to gloat. I think it's actually rather worrying, the fact that the rest of the world is just not up to speed. Um, uh, but we do, I am confident that the expectations of the council and this council are very much aligned to that of government. And I know that in discussions with RMP that they are very committed and they have committed a huge amount of resource. And in many ways, we are globally leading on the industries and all of the technology that's required to do this. Uh, in terms of the second part of your question, working with the community, it's funny, I, was actually, I am actually going to address that in my speech a bit later, because I think if we adore the, adopt these targets, obviously the next bit is to set out the action plan, and the very, very important work of the members of this chamber is going to be convincing and helping the community in doing what they can to help us achieve the net zero targets. I hope that's gone some way to answering your question. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. Thank you very much, Mr Einstein. I'm now going to move on to item three of the agenda to confirm the minutes of the meeting of council held on the 12th of October 2022, pages 5 to 16 of your agenda. Um, members, please vote using the microphone touch screen. Thank you. The vote is now closed. I'm going to ask Jeff Wild to, to read the results. The results are now being displayed. Yes, Chairman, the result of the vote is uh, 42 yes, uh, zero no, and three abstain. So the minutes are approved. Thank you, Thank you very much. Moving on to item four, to receive declarations of interest from members in respect of any matter on the agenda. Members wishing to indicate, please speak by pressing the button under their name on the microphone. Councillor Eggleston. Councillor Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, oh, they've only just come up, the, yes. the names. Uh, I'd like to declare an interest in item number seven on the agenda. Uh, there's a site in the draft district plan, uh, DPH7, where the tenant of the land is Burgess Hill Town Council. Uh, I'm the leader of Burgess Hill Town Council. If you like, Chairman, I can reference in uh, all of the other Burgess Hill councillors for you so that they don't have to stand up and, and declare as well. So that would be Councillor Eves, Cornish, Henwood, Cartwright, Allen, and Gibbs. I think I have the lot. Thank, Thank you very much. Oh, and Chapman. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Eggleston. Um, Councillor Lee. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. With respect to item eight, the uh, net zero, uh, I have a personal project which is very interesting, uh, but it's to do with this subject, and I'm not sure what degree of uh, interest I've got, so I'm going to make life easy, uh, and I shall leave to before that item. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Gibson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to declare an interest in item seven, as uh, a county councillor for the Inverdown district. Thank you. And um, Councillor Jackson. Uh, thank you, Chair Chairman. Uh, I'd like to declare an interest for item seven as a member of First Bill Points and Sayers Common Parish Council. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. I have see no other hands. Um, so I am going to move on to item five to consider any items that I have as Chairman of the Council, um, agreed to take his urgent business. I have none. So we're now going to move on to item six, which is the Chairman's announcements. Two events are approaching in December to which members are warmly welcome and invited. I will be holding my annual civic service on Sunday the 4th of December at St Swithin's Church, East Grinstead. 
invitations are issued today and I hope you very much hope that you can attend. And the next council meeting will be on the 7th of December, will be followed by refreshments. Invitation to this will be circulated shortly. Thank you. I'm now going to move on to item seven, which is the uh, consultation draft district plan, regulation 18, pages 17 to 776 of your agenda. I'm now going to pass to uh, Jeff Wilde to explain the um, process. Thank you. Really, members, it's simply to explain the, the sheer volume of papers you've got in front of you on this item, and just to briefly recap on what you have in front of you and what you'll be asked to approve this evening. It is, it is a, a decision to go out to consultation, as you know. The recommendations, as the Chairman has said, are in paragraph four uh, of, the, of the report. Uh, and you're being asked also to approve um, four appendices. And uh, for, so first of all, the, the main document is, of course, heading one, the draft district plan from pages 35 to 271. We then have the sustainability appraisal document, which is appendix two. And that's on pages 273 to 617. And then we have a third weighty document here, which is a combination of, of documents, which you, you'll see is not only Appendix 3, which uh, starts at the beginning of this document, 619, and goes on to 757, but it then flows into Appendix 4, which is the Community Involvement Plan on pages 759 to 764. Thereafter, there is a, an Appendix 5, the Equalities Impact Assessment, but you're not being asked to approve that tonight. And then there are uh, th th there's a subsequent item also included at the back of that report, which we'll come on to later in the agenda. So I hope that's uh, a quick canter through the, the, the voluminous documents you have in front of you. And of course, the, um, the first document, Appendix 1, you have also have tabled in front of you an, a, a slight change to the wording, which I know Councillor Salisbury will be speaking to in a little while. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that helpful introduction. I'm now going to pass to the Provost, uh, Councillor Salisbury. Well, thank you, Chairman. I thought something must be going on tonight because the Chamber's so full. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure, Members, to be able to propose this um, draft, DPD, uh, draft district plan to you. Uh, and bring forward the, the recommendations. This document has weathered four cross-party workshops where significant uh, work was done, uh, bringing forward some alterations which made the document uh, even better. It's been through two scrutiny committees where everyone has managed to have their say, again, in a cross-party environment. I'd just like to be clear about what we're doing tonight because we're not here to rerun those meetings. We're here to take the recommendations to take this out to a Regulation 18 consultation. The Scrutiny Committee has endorsed this document as sound to go out to consultation and therefore it's down to us to uh, take note of the Scrutiny Committee's uh, findings uh, and, and make the decision to put those recommendations out to the public. Now is the time for the other stakeholders. It's almost as though, in going through this process, we believe that we in this chamber are going to sort of finalise all the wording. And of course, we are at the foothills of a big mountain. Uh, and we have put together a document which goes out to be adjusted and altered by many other organisations who will make the document even more robust. The major part of this document has been available since January. So whilst it's a mighty tome to go through, um, there has been very nearly nine months. Uh, there's very little, uh, about 5% of the document that has changed. To be explicit, tonight you're being asked to approve those documents which Mr Wilde has uh, mentioned and given the page numbers. I was glad he did that. He's referring to the page numbers in the bottom right for cl clarity, because I know when you're in the district plan document itself, that has its own numbering system, which is in the centre of the page. So anything you refer to 
were using the bottom right hand numbers on the pages. However, recently some confusion seems to have arisen with the intention and spirit of one policy, which is DPH7, uh, particularly it would appear with members of the public. The wording under policy requirements in DPH7, which is on page 155 of the draft, draft district plan, should be read in the round with DPI5 on page 179. And therefore, because of the confusion, I have chosen to make a change to the wording of the second to last bullet point in those policies about the reprovision of allotments to make this link more clear. The policy, policy, which is the ninth bullet point on page 155 about the reprovision of allotments, will now read as according to the um, paper that was tabled for you tonight. And it will read, secure the provision of an equal number of allotments in Burgess Hill in line with policy DPI 5. It's the, with this wording, Chairman, as tabled, that I formally propose the recommendations set out on page 17. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. Um, this is being um, seconded by Councillor Ash Edwards. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak? I'll reserve my right to speak at the end and wrap up. Um, at the end of the debate, okay. that's okay. Thank you, Councillor Ash Edwards. Um, I have uh, two councillors at this moment. Uh, so the first councillor is Robert, Councillor Robert Eggleston, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, firstly, apologies for not wearing a tie, but unaccountably, uh, I appear to have gone up a whole neck size uh, in the past few weeks, and none of my shirts fit. Uh, to, to tie up anymore, so I, I do apologise for my disgrace. Um, as you know, Chairman, uh, I wish uh, to move an amendment uh, to, the, to, the, to the plan, and specifically in respect of DPH 7, which would be to add the words at the front of point one, save for the removal of site DPH 7 in the draft district plan. Uh, I appreciate that, that Councillor Salisbury uh, is trying to uh, improve the, the wording in the policy requirement. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that the improvement works, uh, and hopefully you'll understand why uh, from my amendment. Uh, as members will know, B8 Burgess Hill Town Council has leased the Chanctaby allotment from Network Rail and its predecessors since, 19, since before 1959, and the current lease was signed in 2010. Our relationship with them is good, uh, but it is fragile and delicate because they, as the landlord, have never entertained the sale of the land or been willing to grant long-term security of tenure. That's just <coughs> the way it's been for the last 60-odd years. And for all that time, it hasn't been a problem because an alternative use of the land uh, never came forward. DPH7 fundamentally changes the risks and so upsets this fragile and delicate balance. The Town Council's position on allotment sites is set out in its neighbourhood plan. Uh, policy G5 states very clearly that all allotment sites should be retained. And as we know, uh, the neighbourhood plan forms part of the district plan. And it's not disputed that the Town Council has a statutory responsibility to provide allotment sites. Burgess Hill has 261 plots on six sites and meets its statutory duty, notwithstanding that it has a long waiting list. Uh, but the Town Council has no suitable land of its own in order to increase provision. Now, the loss of this site could lead to a reduction of 24% in the number of allotment plots in Burgess Hill unless replacements are found. It can't make up that, that shortfall by the allocation at Brookley or on the Western Arc, because officers confirmed to me yesterday that these would be allocated to residents in those two communities. We know from the evidence base uh, that there is a shortfall of provision in Burgess Hill, and I'm pleased uh, that District Council and officers on the Town Council are going to work to address that. Now, I was gently rebuked at Scrutiny Committee for pressing for the removal of this site, 
and not relying on the assurances of officers in respect of the policies set out in the draft district plan. I draw members' attention to the penultimate bullet point on the bottom of page 155, and I acknowledge uh, the proposal to amend it. Um, and you would like to think uh, that that gives the assurances that we all need and that the allotment holders in Burgess Hill need. However, I found out yesterday from officers that if Network Rail does not renew the lease, and I quote, there would be no requirement for them, i.e. allotments, to be re-provided. The proposed policy DPH7 seeks to strengthen the position in relation to re-provision, but unfortunately it doesn't. Technically, the lease is rolling in nature anyway, so renewal doesn't apply. But the point is, and this is important, should Network Rail terminate the lease in advance of any development and let the land lie, it will cease to be allotment land. It will not be open space. So the assurance, um, and so therefore would not be covered by DPH7, even as amended, or, or DPI5. And that's the jeopardy we have uh, with the current legal relationship between the parties. So the assurance that we had from scrutiny committee really doesn't work. It means that if there is a risk of loss of 24% of allotment space in Burgess Hill without compensating reprovision, re if an allocation of the site comes forward when the land is no longer open space. And we can't, I submit, as a council, let that risk stand and survive. Now, I was told today uh, that the, uh, there's a memorandum of understanding uh, between Mid-Sussex District Council and Network Rail that deals with these issues. I don't know the terms of that. I don't know whether it's legally binding or how it protects the existing tenancy. One more paragraph. Councilor so again, Eggleston, it's far from clear. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you have had your five minutes. Are you I've got one up? more paragraph. Okay, please go for it. So again, it's far from clear whether this site is protected in any meaningful way. And if we wish to protect allotment provision, as of now, we need to protect that site. There will be other opportunities because there will be other iterations of the district plan when a proposal for this site could come back in a more robust way which will stand scrutiny of ourselves but more importantly of residents and the planning inspector. My proposal is that for now we remove this site because it is the safest thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Eggleston. May I ask, um, have you, you made a, a proposal? Do you have wording for your proposal? And if so, could you please read it out? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I don't, maybe you didn't pick up uh, but the email, but the, the wording is just to add at the, first, at the start of the first uh, recommendation, save for the removal of site DPH7 in the draft district plan. Thank you. And um, before you sit down, do you have a second to this motion? Uh, I was hoping to invite Councillor Samantha Smith to second it. No. Uh, then, I'm, then I'm sure Councillor Henwood or Councillor Reid. Um, Chairman, I wish to second Councillor Henwood. Right. Councillor Henwood. Um, do you wish to speak, Councillor Henwood? I would like to reserve uh, okay. for after the discussion. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to debate this um, motion. Does anyone wish to speak on this motion alone? Okay. Councillor Eaves. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chairman. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, it's important to remember that allotments are not brownfield sites. And indeed, this site is not listed in the Mid-Sussex District Council Brownfield Land Register, except as Sheila ID 83 for 100 dwellings. 
and it's described as Burgess Hill Station Yard stroke car park, which would be fine. But somehow further work, in inverted commas, has happened and it's now been extended to the allotments. There is nowhere to reprovision these allotments. Uh, I appreciate Councillor uh, Salisbury's efforts to reach out in the wording, but when he says in Burgess Hill, that could mean Northern Ark, Western Ark, all of that is Burgess Hill, and that's just not good enough. It's not close enough to where the allotments are now. Destroying allotments is about destroying community and destroying the grow, cook, eat paradigm, which can help people's well-being in so many ways. Fewer food miles, no additives, cheaper food, education for children as to where their food comes from, no packaging. So we want to defend these allotments. We're in favour of building on Brownfield, but Brownfield is not allotments. We're in favour of urban density. Fair enough. But the biggest elephant in the room and the biggest brownfield site is New River, right slap in the middle of town. Nobody's talking about it, sitting there doing nothing since 2018. How is the District Council tolerating this? Thank you, Councillor Eves. Um, may I ask <laughs> Councillor Gibson, please? <laughs> You're sp speaking on Councillor Eccleston's proposal. Yes, I, I, I have one observation. I actually want to speak on the main amendment primarily. Uh, but what worries me about this, and it might be something that the Cabinet member can assist with, is that I am going to talk about the, uh, the, the, the what's the term, the oversupply for resilience later on. Um, okay. And I just wonder what the impact of this amendment would have on the viability of this draft plan if indeed the oversupply for resilience was to drop to two. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. I'm going to ask now um, Councillor Robert Salisbury to speak. <laughs> Now, thank you, Chairman. Um, whilst I understand Councillor uh, Eccleston's position, I, I, I do understand it. In fact, um, I, and I understand the importance of allotments uh, as well as everybody else. If his motion was to go ahead, it would take 300 number out of the draft plan, which would leave an excess of two. In addition, there are no other brownfield sites. Now, everybody has been hammering, uh, myself and the officers, about incorporating brownfield sites. Go back, look again, find more brownfield sites. Well, we did that. And the landowner was agreeable to looking again at the number that could go on the site. If the, this is not in the plan, it will mean a site for 300 houses going onto greenfield land. And you know we are desperately trying to protect greenfield land. And I would also invite people to try and understand what the word allotment means. It is not a city garden. An allotment comes under the 1908 Act as amended by the 1972 provisions. So that if a new piece of land was found and it was purchased for allotments, it would come under that Act and be protected forever. It wouldn't be, a, Mid Sussex could help in, and would help in finding such land. However, we would not be able to own it if we purchased it. We would hand it over to the town council because they are the statutory holders of allotments. So I cannot support your um, uh, amendment to remove this site, councillor, um, because it uh, fundamentally pulls a brick out in the middle of the plan, taking the numbers down to only two in excess, and also going against the very principle that we've been trying to establish, which is as much brownfield land as we can. And because it's not a statutory allotment site, it does count as brownfield land. And as you know, the landowner could terminate the lease and do what he likes with that land. The whole point of the provision of this policy is so that should he then come forward to develop it, we have a policy in place about what has to be done to protect the provision of alternative allotments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. I have several um, councillors who wish to speak. Can I reiterate, this is in respect of the amendment from Councillor Eggleston that we're discussing at present. We'll get Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as Councillor Salisbury just said, we did have a 
quite a few meetings. I was chairing the uh, working group, and at no time during the working group, we, though we scrutinised all the plans, all the sites, did the word allotments come up. And that included two members of the opposition, actually three members of the opposition. Um, in scrutiny, I was the one who told Councillor um, Eggleston, he will remember, that he, he's got that one horribly wrong. He requested in that scrutiny meeting, short memory obviously, that he would like it to revert back to the original number, not the total removal of DPH 7. And as Councillor um, Soldier just mentioned, he wants to take away from the residents of uh, Burgess Hill, this is Councillor Eggleston, not you Councillor Salisbury, the fact they can get a new station, they won't get a new station with only what you were suggesting, and they won't get a new station if they don't get anything. Um, so, but I wonder if he did admit to tell his impromptu meeting last night or the night before, which resulted in all our inboxes getting filled. Because you concentrated on one aspect of DPH7, not the whole round. This is a brownfield site. It's the biggest brownfield site we've got, despite what Councillor um, Eves has just gone on about in Burgess Hill. So I'm afraid I can't support your recommendation because you changed your mind for scrutiny. <coughs> you didn't inform your working members of the group what you wanted them to, to raise at the working group. So, no, I'm sorry, Councillor Edison. You're a fly fish and there must be, a, must be an election in the air, I think. <laughs> Councillor Sandy Ellis, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say, as a long-standing town councillor, I understand the concerns and I understand the importance of allotments. Um, but what I, I don't understand is we really do need to have this, you know, planning requirement so we've got provisions. Because in Burgess Hill Town Council's two, 2032 document, um, they haven't, on their milestones, for up to 2024, they haven't even mentioned allotments, and they're moving on to 2027, they have, but they're not of their three priorities. So I really do think that I could not leave these, this land with any protection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Matthew Cornish, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a point, really, um, in support of Councillor Eves and Councillor Eggleston, really, on the human impact of, of the loss of, let's call it an allotment for, for what we will see it as things growing in the ground and plants and greenery. It's an allotment. I know we're calling it a brownfield site, but the people that have filled your inboxes do not call it a brownfield site. For them, it's a source of uh, relaxation. It's help for their mental health. It's a point in the community that supports their well-being and, in most cases, their livelihoods. So, as much as we're bickering between us, this is people's livelihoods and well-being that we're discussing and that we're talking about. So, please, can I implore that we think about that while we're discussing this this evening? And on Councillor Eggleston's motion, I think this is about moving it to the next stage, uh, the, the draft plan to the next stage. So I think we need to think about the, the meaning for the residents that live near to that allotment and what that potentially will mean for them if this disappears, because we need to see where the alternative site is. And I think that would probably help the residents that have filled our inboxes uh, with their worry and their concerns that this is an amenity that will be taken away from them. So I think in support of those residents that have e emailed us, I think we need to go back to them fairly quickly to let them know where this proposed land is, because as far as I'm aware, as a resident of Burgess Hill, there is nowhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Councillor Cornish. Um, Councillor Samantha Smith. Sorry, can I write another point of order, Chairman? Point of explanation. Uh, is it a point of explanation? Yeah, Uh, yeah, mainly because my name has been mentioned and various references to the neighbourhood plan. Uh, so the Burgess Hill neighbourhood plan includes a provision of 100 units on the station site. Um, and so 
the 300 is an addition of, of, of 200, uh, not a, an increase from one to, to the total of, of 400. So it's 200 additional units. Uh, the neighbourhood plan also includes uh, the provision for allotments on land that's owned by Mid Sussex District Council. So, uh, Town Council hasn't ignored the need for uh, additional uh, allotments. I just thought I'd make that clear to members. Thank you. Um, Councillor Samantha Smith, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, whilst I understand the need for more homes to be built in Mid Sussex and, and also to use the Brown sites uh, to do this, I cannot agree when a site in the plan is used constantly by residents and the community, such as allotments. These spaces are so important to lives and the well-being of residents and their families who use them and have done so for decades. There is a long waiting list in Burgess Hill uh, of residents wanting a plot uh, on the allotments, so clearly there is a demand for them. I also understand it is the town and parish councils to protect these sites and to look after them. The allotment in question is in Chanctaby Road, which is central within the town. Some residents who use the allotments cannot drive and therefore would find it extremely difficult to go uh, to a new site out of town. Others, it's a place to teach children of their families about growing healthy food, the science behind it, and we all know how important eating healthily is. Not to mention the mental health uh, cases have risen in recent years. Uh, we can't forget the impact on losing these sites would bring to our wildlife too. We need to save and protect these little green gems in our towns because the importance is for everyone and everything. Therefore, I cannot agree to the allotments being built on in this plan. Please can it be assured that the allotment users will be informed and information and updates regarding this site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have two more councillors wishing to speak on this um, motion from Mr Councillor Eggleston. Uh, the first is Councillor Norman Webster. Please Thank you. remain seated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I agree with Councillor Salisbury and I agree with much of what has been said by various members um, across the Council. But once again at this late stage we've got Councillor Eggleston introducing an amendment to work which has been passing through the democratic process and the public process of this Council for the last nine months. And I, I was shocked at scrutiny, quite frankly, when people voted against the plan um, as they did, because what they were voting for was to deny residents the opportunity to make their comments, comments which will ultimately end up with the um, inspector. <coughs> And the inspector will have to read all of those comments that residents make. And the inspector of the district plan will make his or her decisions accordingly. Over the last 24 hours, I've received 12 emails. And one of them I received twice. And I've read every one of them very carefully. And um, I, I am slightly confused because the Burgess Hill Neighbourhood Plan um, Policy G5 allotment sites on page 71 talks about there are currently six allotment sites in the town as part of the ward consultation exercise in 2012. Sites for new allotment sites were proposed and these are supported in this policy. Allotments are owned and managed by Burgess Hill Town Council. So, Chairman, the Burgess Hill Neighbourhood Plan only refers to those sites owned by Burgess Hill Town Council, in my opinion, and the railway station site does not belong to the Town Council. 
Um, and furthermore, policy TC5, the station quarter policy on page 37 states that the land around the station is very inefficiently used with large tracts of land used for surface car parking. These could be redeveloped for residential and employment use. The actual policy wording includes the following, redevelopment to include residential units, retail, stroke employment, stroke hotel, and improved parking facilities. Chairman, if that's in the Burgess Hill Town Council neighborhood plan, I, I am very confused about what they actually want. Um, and I'll leave it at, at, at that, I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Webster. Um, finally, I hope on this... I help for the point of order because... Oh, needs to be appointed. Jeff, may I refer to you, please? Madam Chairman, if it's a point of personal explanation about uh, something that has been misquoted by Councillor Eggleston, then of course he has the right to respond to that. But I, I didn't hear anything attributed to Councillor Eggleston in, in uh, Councillor Webster's last speech. I'm sorry, I can't allow that point of order. Thank you. So our last um, speaker is Councillor Jonathan Asher Edwards. Thank you very much, um, Tim. I've, I've listened very carefully to um, the discussion that the members have had, and I think yeah, we need to be very clear that this um, discussion is not about whether we have allotments or not, but about how best we can try, within the powers we have as a council, uh, to protect the position uh, for residents in Burgess Hill. Because as has been articulated, this is not a site that has very much protection at all. It's not statutory allotments and there's very little planning protection to it. And so I think it's a, an accepted point. If the landowner wants to end the lease, close the gates and say, thanks very much, no more allotments, there is pretty much nothing anyone can do about that. That's clearly not an outcome that anyone would want to see, but we need to understand that that is the current position. And so the question is, how do you try and improve that position? Now, the amendment suggests just take it all out and hope for the best. I don't think that's an unfair characterization of what we've been asked to agree. And I accept that some members will, uh, will support that and hope for the best indeed. But that isn't a certain way of protecting a lot of use for residents in Burgess Hill. By introducing a policy requirement that any development in this location would require a reprovision of allotments, that introduces a policy requirement that this council could use at planning application stage to ensure that reprovision of suitable allotment land took place. And I think that is uh, an important thing that we need to uh, consider. We also need to just think about the implications of what this motion is asking us to do on the district plan, because as, as has been said, 300 houses coming out, that would leave the draft plan with a buffer of two houses. Now, I don't think anybody would uh, say that that stands up to scrutiny as a buffer um, that would survive contact with reality, and we certainly don't want to go into a consultation uh, with anyone else from the developer community lining up to try and pick holes in the plan. So it's so very unsafe in my view uh, to go into a consultation with a buffer of two houses. And we also just need to reflect, I think, Chairman and, and Councillor Webster referred to, uh, to this, that the regeneration of Burgess Hill Station has been in local plans for 18 years. 2004 it was first allocated, been in neighbourhood plans since, and yet it hasn't been delivered. That should tell us something about the current policy position. It's not viable, so it needs to be improved in order to deliver a regeneration of the uh, railway station area for uh, residents for better accessibility, all the things that we know, because that railway station is not the best that can be achieved for a town of Burgess Hills size. So I think the best way, Chairman, is to go out to consultation. Uh, I completely agree with Councillor Smith's point around the need to work with interested parties to try and find the right outcome. Consultants have been appointed to look at alternative sites, and it's my hope, Chairman, 
that actually at Regulation 19 we could bring forward and identify the reprovider site. And I think that would be the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to ask uh, the seconder of the motion, Councillor Henwood, if you wish to speak. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, is it appropriate at this time to ask for a recorded vote on this amendment, please? Noted. Thank you. Did I'd you first like to respond to some uh, of the... I'm sorry, sorry, did you have the sufficient so supporters? Have, uh, how many people do I need? Five. Five. five people. Can I have five supporters for recorded vote, please? You have five Is people. that sufficient? Thank you. Thank you. So, Chairman, first I'd like to address my remarks to some of the comments from the councillors, if you don't mind, before I actually present my seconding. Uh, first of all, Thornfields, one of the developers for Burgess Hill, suggested 150 <coughs> units on the car park. Uh, Burgess Hill Town Council had no problem with this proposal. This was in the past, and also a transport hub. Our objection now is for the building on allotments. I would also like to um, also say to Councillor Webster, as many of us at the scrutiny, we did not vote against the plan. We abstained. We think, yes, we need a district plan, but it needs to be improved, just to correct that. Councillor Marsh, I will bring this up later, but at no time during our four meetings, I was on the working party, at no time during those four meetings did we ever address Burgess Hill Station, and I will go into that a bit more fully in a minute, please. Brick, brownfield sites? Uh, we actually did consider at the committee meeting two brownfield sites, disused brickworks. No, that was not appropriate to build on those. I didn't quite understand why, but we had to accept the majority's opinion. The best, the brownfield site, which is, as Councillor Eves has said, is the one New River. Right, I was on the working party chairman, and we considered applied the approved mythology to all of these proposals, okay? The mythology consisted looking, considering things such as landscape, trees, listed buildings, impact on the AONB. And, but the committee never, never considered this particular site, <coughs> BHS7. The first we heard about that was the final meeting when it was on a list listed two brownfield sites, Burgess Hill Station and the orchards, and it listed the units that were provided. That was it. That's all we ever considered. The mythology was never gone through on this site of Burgess Hill Station. The mythology, looking at the constraints, and we know now a huge constraint of 63 allotments are there. I feel sure if the eight members of that committee had actually been able to apply this mythology to this site, they would never have supported it being put forward in this draft plan. Evidence, we're always talking about evidence, which is needed, evidence. 63 allotments on this site. 24% of the allotments in Burgess Hill. A waiting list of 246. Specifically, for Changtonbury Road, a list of 98, waiting for over two years. No mitigation is possible. There is no alternative provision. The, no areas within the 20-minute walk, which was one of the criteria in the mythology. How far away are the facilities? Councillor Hebbard, you have had your three minutes. Could you bring it to a conclusion, please? Okay. The last point. We all this, okay? We are all are supposed to be supporting health and well-being policy DP S6, which quotes opportunities to increase community connectivity and social inclusion by providing spaces for the community to gather, socialize, and impact. I appeal all of us to support removing this, accepting this amendment, and removing this site from the present. We have how many? 260 Sheila sites that we could consider as alternative. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hedward. We are now going to move forward to a vote on this amendment. Could um, councillors... It's a named vote, yes, isn't it? Definitely. So, Jeff, if I pass you to carry out this vote. Um, so I'll read out your names, and if you could just indicate whether you're voting for, against, or abstaining on the amendments. 
Uh, Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Ash Edwards. Against. Councillor Bates. For. Councillor John Belsey. Against. Councillor Margaret Belsey. Against. Councillor Alison Bennett. For. Councillor Liz Bennett. Absent. Apologies. Councillor Bradbury. Against. Councillor Brown. For. Councillor Cartwright. For. Councillor Chapman. For. Councillor Co. Gunnell White. Councillor Coote. Against. Councillor Cornish. For. Councillor Demier. Against. Councillor Dempsey. For. Councillor Edwards. For. Councillor Eggleston. For. Councillor Ellis. Against. Councillor Eaves. For. Councillor Gibbs. For. Councillor Gibson. For. Councillor Hatton. For. Councillor Henwood. For. Councillor Hillier. Against. Councillor Hussain. Councillor Jackson. For. Councillor Knight. Against. Councillor Lee. Against. Councillor, sorry, Andrew Lee, I beg your pardon. Councillor Anthea Lee. Okay. Councillor Marsh. Against. Councillor Mockford. Four. Councillor Peacock. Against. Councillor Phillips. Four. Councillor Pulfer. Against. Councillor Salisbury. Against. Councillor Smith. Upstairs. Councillor Spiraski. Four. Councillor Stockwell. Against. Councillor Swetman. Against. Councillor Trumbull? Against. Councillor Walker? Against. Councillor Webb? Against. Councillor Webster? Against. And Councillor Whitaker? Against. Members, have I omitted anybody in that poll? No. Thank you. I'll take a moment to add up the, the scores. Chairman, I, I have the, uh, the results of the, uh, the recorded vote, and uh, on, on uh, Councillor Eggleston's amendment, the votes are 19 in favour, 25 against, and two abstentions, so the amendment falls. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to return to the substantive motion of, that we were discussing on item 7. Does anyone, any councillor wish to speak? further on the substantive motion that we have before us. Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, propose a, a little modification with regard to the uh, period of the uh, period of the consultation. And I did give you notice that I wanted to do that. Thank you. Um, so I think we all we all value the public consultation process and uh, it, it, a six week a six weeks period uh, was considered uh, to be insufficient at the uh, scrutiny committee meeting which I didn't attend and there was a proposal to extend it to 12 weeks um, uh, however I want uh, I'd like the, the 12 weeks ends on the um, the 19th of December so immediately before Christmas so I think in order, to, uh, in order to give an opportunity to the public, the stakeholders, uh, and uh, particularly third tier local authorities, of which I represent two or three um, parish councils, uh, to, to, make, to make their own representation, as well, of course, as the landowners and the developers, I would like to propose that um, it's extended to nine weeks, which would take it to the, um, the 9th, of Jan uh, 9th of January, I think. And I suggest that hardly any uh, time would be lost uh, with, that, uh, with that proposal. 
Um, um, you know, I, uh, I think the, I'd like to say that I feel the officers have worked very hard to pr produce this more logical district plan. Um, and I think it's, it's worthy of, of giving that extra bit of time and, uh, and basically I'd like to uh, propose, uh, propose that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, I understand, Councillor Eves, you wish to, you're going to second it. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right? Thank you very much. Does anyone wish to speak on this amendment? I see I have um, Councillor Ian Gibson wishes to speak on this amendment. No? Okay. Does anyone, could they indicate if they actually wish to speak on this amendment? Councillor Marsh. I don't know if Councillor Dempsey wants to go before me. No, he doesn't. He wants to speak on the other one, doesn't he? Thank you, Chairman. Right. Everybody spoke about that in scrutiny, did they? Well, actually, I think three people spoke. They wanted to extend it. And six weeks is the statutory uh, consultation period, which was put, set out by the officers. Uh, the, your motion was defeated in scrutiny. Um, so what you're effectively saying is you want to go for another, add another three weeks. Of course, everybody during Christmas and New Year are going to be going, oh, just a minute, I've got, I've got to do my consultation bit in. I don't know what land you live in, I'm sorry. The for the first six weeks is where people, I can assure you now, I haven't gone through this process before, the vast majority of consultation responses come in the first two or three weeks, not towards the end, because they don't want to lose out on it. And they're certainly not going to do it over Christmas and New Year. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Um, Councillor Salisbury, do you wish to speak on this amendment? Thank you, Chairman. Of course I do. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you might. Uh, I don't know who you've been speaking to, Councillor Brown, but I have had one representation from outside bodies requesting a 12-week consultation period, and that was CPRE. Nobody else has asked for 12 weeks. The six weeks is the norm, and it's, this requirement's reflected in the Council's adopted statement of community involvement. Previous consultations in this Council for the District Plan and for the Sites Allocation DBD have all been six weeks. We've had nobody write in to complain about that. We've always, as Councillor Marsh said, had a very high return within that six-week period. For example, the DPD, we got 2,000 comments made by over 1,300 respondents within that six-week period. There are a range of mechanisms that the Council used to engage with the community and stakeholders, which is set out in the Community Involvement Plan, which is Appendix 4 in your documentation. A further consultation, of course, will take place at Regulation 19. Um, there's a lot of work to do to get to Regulation 19 once the comments come in from the Regulation 18, and therefore uh, keeping that timetable on track is important for the officers in their work. And therefore, I cannot support that and would urge people to uh, turn this motion down and to refrain, uh, to remain rather, with the six week consultation period. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. I have um, Councillor Hem, would you wish to speak on this amendment? Yes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, it was brought up at scrutiny, Councillor Marsh, but not all of us are on scrutiny. It gave a few people the opportunity to express their opinion about this and the length of time to, to, to uh, have a consultation. I do not see any reason why this cannot be extended a bit further uh, until January. Sorry, Jerry, you, you okay. I expressed my opinion at scrutiny. How many of you expressed your opinion at scrutiny? How many of us are on scrutiny, Chairman? That's my point. Thank you very point. much. Thank I, you. You raised your point. Um, if I had no... Councillor Bradbury. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I wasn't going to speak on this, but I just can't understand this debate that we're having. Six weeks is the statutory norm. It was discussed at scrutiny. Councillor Henwood seems to be taking issue with the decision of the scrutiny committee. If we, if we extend that to its logical conclusion, every single point that was debated by a scrutiny committee would then have to be debated by this full council. I'm sorry, that's just complete nonsense. Let's stick with this six weeks. It's completely sensible and the statutory norm. Yeah. 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 Ye
Thank you, Councillor Bradbury. I have no other speaker, so I'm going to pass to uh, Councillor Eves, the seconder of this motion. Amendment. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, Councillor Marsh, six weeks is the norm. It's not uh, a requirement, it's minimum. Yes, we did raise this in scrutiny and we proposed 12 weeks, which was defeated. So in a spirit of magnanimity and graciousness, we are now suggesting nine for your delectation. And indeed, not all of you were at scrutiny. So we're giving everybody the chance to voice their opinion. It is exactly because it is Christmas that we want this extension because we don't believe that officers are going to start work on this on the 20th of December. Uh, I don't know what world you live in, but I don't think that's going to happen. So that is exactly why we give the public the chance over the Christmas holidays when they're bored with their families to look at this thing and submit <laughs> their opinions. <laughs> Councillor Salisbury yeah, mentions only one body. That body is a pretty important body, the CPRE, with very qualified people in it. They want this extension, and I think that speaks volumes. So I don't believe the officers will be starting this on the 20th of, January, of December. And uh, I would say to Councillor Bradbury, just because it happened in scrutiny doesn't mean we don't validate it here. That's what we're here for. That's why we turn up. So there you have it. Thank I you, move Eves. nine weeks. Thank you, Councillor Eves. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Salisbury, as the mover of the original motion, do you wish to speak further before we go to a vote? Chairman, six weeks takes us to just before Christmas. Nine weeks as a sop to not being 12 weeks takes us right through the Christmas holidays. Uh, it does nothing. And the CPRE is not the big body who is going to influence what we do. There are out there electricity companies, sewage companies, water companies, there are health providers. In point of order, the, speak, the seconder speaks last. I really think this is out of order. Councillor Wyatt? I'm sorry, Jeff Wyatt. Yes, Chairman. The procedure rules state at uh, paragraph 13.9 that the relevant cabinet member shall have the right to speak immediately after, um, immediately before the vote is taken. Now, Councillor Salisbury has already spoken during the yes. debate, and I think perhaps then that would be his opportunity taken earlier than it would otherwise have been taken. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're now going to vote on the amendment. Um, members to vote using their microphone touchscreen, please. Yes. Can I have quiet, please? I'm just going to refer to uh, Jeff Wilde to read the motion of the amendment, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. This is um, a, a, an amendment to the recommendation 4.1. So that currently reads, reads, the council is recommended to approve the following documents for Regulation 18 consultation for a period of six weeks, commencing on 7th of November 2022. Now, the amendment is to change the six weeks to nine weeks. So, members, you are voting on whether to change that figure from six to nine. Are put back to zero. Yes, I agree. If we could do that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay.
I'm going to ask uh, Jeff Wilde to read out the result, please. Yes, Chairman, the, the result of the vote on Councillor Brown's amendment is 16 in favour, 25 against, and three abstentions, so the amendment falls. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillors. Right. Um, we've done that. I'll pause. Yes. So now we're going back to the substantive, substantive motion. And have I got any other speakers on that? I see we have Councillor Dempsey. We're going back now to the substantive motion. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. I, I wondered if I could speak on some elements that hopefully we can actually all agree on. Um, Specifically, the policies of um, DPN 1 and DPN 2 on biodiversity, geodiversity, and nature recovery, and on biodiversity net gain. Um, as members will know, uh, both of those refer to uh, contributing towards the local nature recovery strategy, which obviously West Sussex County Council will be leading on, and also to biodiversity opportunity areas. Um, and both of them refer to the important need to prevent fragmentation and deterioration of the ecological network in, in Mid-Sussex. Um, obviously, delivering on both of those policies requires a clear understanding of, um, of the biodiversity that we have in Mid-Sussex, uh, including a habitat and natural capital mapping. Um, because particularly in relation to biodiversity net gain, uh, we can't deliver that if we don't know what we've already got and if we don't know where we can best uh, recover nature in our in our network and i noticed that lepus in their sustainability uh, appraisal uh, also recommended mapping of this this kind um, i saw that officers had responded in that that work is ongoing to map the ecological network and habitats of mid-sussex and i imagine that uh, refers to the uh, sustainable economy action plan uh, objection uh, objective eight uh, which commits to beginning by contracting a consultant to deliver a natural capital mapping that will form the basis for a Mid-Sussex nature recovery network. So I, I know that this is an area where there's significant cross-party support. I know it's an area that everyone's already working on. So I wondered if I could ask Councillor Hillier as the uh, uh, responsible cabinet member if he could give us an update on where that work's got to um, and, and, uh, and, and reaffirm the, the commitment of Council to delivering that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor do you wish to respond? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, and also thank you, Councillor Dempsey, for your positive engagement on this uh, and other matters around this. It's much appreciated. Um, I agree that for the biodiversity and nature recovery policies to be effective, there needs to be clarity over the baseline position in the district. As you note, in April of this year, the Council approved the Sustainable Economic Strategy the SES, which I'll use going on because it's just quicker. Objective eight of which was to improve, manage and promote biodiversity and nature recovery. One of the actions um, agreed to achieve this objection, objective was for the council to contract a consultant to deliver a short-term desk-based natural capital mapping of Mid-Sussex to form the basis of a Mid-Sussex nature recovery network. Since the approval of the SES, Sussex Nature Partnership has been identifying and mapping areas in the district where na nature recovery could be focused. This will actually build on the historic mapping of priority habitats, green infrastructure and biodiversity opportunity areas. The benefit of Sussex Nature Partnership carrying out this mapping is that there will be a strategic approach across both East and West Sussex. Uh, as you know, the secondary legislation and further guidance falling from the Environmental Act is still expected. However, in the meantime, work is beginning on the emerging local nature recovery strategy, with West Sussex County Council taking the lead, as you alluded to, as the responsible authority in this area. Work will again be coordinated across East Sussex County Council and the Sussex Nature Partnership. As a result of all of this, the Council does not need to commission the work originally anticipated in the SES. I agree wholeheartedly with you about the benefits of engaging our local communities in respect of the local nature recovery strategy. And I can assure you there will be plenty of opportunity for local consultation and, most importantly, engagement going forward. I hope that helps with your point. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. Um, Councillor Ian Gibson, please. Thank you, Chairman. The third time lucky. Um, there's lots of good things in this document, um, particularly in the areas that uh, were highlighted um, by uh, Councillor Dempsey. Um, 
I'm going to talk more about the, the site selection side of it um, and the implications that have gone on from, from that. Um, I'm not going to repeat anything that I said in this chamber on the 29th of June, but I am pleased to see that the officers have picked up on the comments that I made about um, how um, oversupply for resilience should be approached in terms of being a percentage of what needs to be done, not a percentage of the overall target. Um, and I know that that is a substantial change in the position of this, this council previously towards this word of comfort. And that comfort, if you remember, drove us to have an excess of 907 sites, uh, houses, in an overall total of 1,704. Now, if I look at this, then what I see there is that um, if we'd followed that approach, then we could have been taking out something like 800 houses from the DPD. And that 800 houses, of course, sit within my division of Inverdown. Uh, in, the gap, in the green gap between Crawley Down and East Grinstead. Coupled with the new, the new approach, which I wholly support, this new approach on oversupply for resilience of, of the order of 5%, I think it's slightly less than that, um, then what I see here is that it's created the headroom, which I think is probably, I, I wonder whether it's that headroom which has enabled the Cooksai site to be removed. That's 1,600. Um, officers have told me that it's to do with the traffic impacts and I thank them for correcting my uh, initial reading of the very lengthy document which actually isn't on this table, it sits underneath it in terms of the four appendices I think there are on the transport, but it is in there. And I do understand now that the mitigation of the Cooksley site it, it, it has significant traffic impacts on the, on the junctions around it. And the mitigation is if you don't build the houses, you don't have the congestion at the junctions. And I can thoroughly accept that as being making sense. But what I don't understand is that the DPD finished its transport assessment with the most congested junction in this district being the junction between the Turners Hill Road and Wallage Lane, which is a rat run between East Grinstead and Crawley. And that rat run avoids the Turners Hill Crossroads and it avoids the A264. And what I can't understand is that if we put 2,300 houses or 2,700 houses, whatever it is, on Cravett Park and on, Hun on Huntsland and Hurst Farms, then magically that junction is not over capacity, it's crossed out. And I, I just wonder, what is it doing that if you build more houses, and, and maybe somebody can help me with that. Um, Councillor Gibson, would you come to conclusion, I'll please? come to the conclusion, I'll skip the next two points, but I do want to say that I listened to Mr Gove on Sunday. Um, he started with bad news that he supports the 300,000 figure, and yes, that means that we are committed in this district to this figure of 20,000 across the period, around about 1,200 per year. But what he went on to say after that, quite heartenly, because he said that we should engage with communities in order to look at what communities, what their needs are for housing, what should be built, and where it should be built. And the point that I would make is that this plan is still not doing that, that we are telling communities what will be built, not asking them, not treating them like adults, we're treating them like children. Um, and that, for me, still makes this a very difficult, a, a difficult plan to accept. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, Councillor Bennett, Alison Bennett, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, the hours of hard work that officers have put in and will continue to put in um, into this review of the district plan. Um, I know it's an eye-watering task, and I know also that the outputs are fairly eye-watering too. Um, and this has all been undertaken against a background of shifting legislation and the potential of legislation changing all through the spring as we were waiting the publication of the levelling up bill. And also, to be fair, pressure from us local politicians and the communities that we represent. Um, I was pleased in this version of the district plan review to see that thanks to pressure from uh, me and some of my colleagues, um, a secondary school has been included into um, the strategic site at Sayers Common and also at Crabbit Park. 
um, that gives me some reassurance. However, um, I won't be able to support the district plan review as presented tonight and intend to abstain. Um, rather than start with a set of policies that we believe are right for our district, I feel that officers are forced by national planning requirements to hit a number of houses to be delivered and then abandon whichever policies are needed to get to that number. I am, that's to be clear, in favour of plan making and of having a plan. I am not in favour of the removal of so many policies which only four years ago this council approved. The abandonment, for example, of the 2018 district plan settlement hierarchy, which meant that a settlement could only grow in proportion to the size of the existing population, has gone. This review has concluded that highly limited growth is possible, or that, only highly, that only limited growth is possible in East Grinstead and Haywards Heath, plus the AONB, which comprise, makes up half the district. This approach has two bad consequences. First is the urbanisation of the south of the district with the overdevelopment and coalescence of settlements like Oldbourne and Sayers of Common appearing inevitable. But the second is that it also condemns much of the district to a future preserved in aspic with no growth and limited opportunities for those from modest backgrounds to build a town, build a life in towns like East Grinstead and Haywards Heath. For example, under the proposals before us, one site in my village, the site west of Kemp's in Hurst Pierpoint, will deliver 27 much needed affordable homes. It seems to me incredible this is nearly double the number that the entirety of East Grinstead will deliver in this proposal, which is just 14. Councillor Bedditt, could you bring a yeah. conclusion, please? This is not responsible plan making with an eye on the future. It is a myopic proposal that pulls up the drawbridge and denies those that come after us the chance to build their lives throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Eggleston. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, firstly, I'd uh, just like to say that I don't believe that we've uh, voted on Councillor Salisbury's amendment, and I didn't know whether uh, that was going to be wrapped up in the substantive, but I don't it recall is. that we've voted on it. But it will be separate to the substantive yeah. Motion from council hasn't accepted the amendment. I refer to Mr. Wilde. The motion moved by the by the at the original motion at the beginning of this debate included the changed wording, so it doesn't need to be put forward as an amendment because there was no motion of being um, being put forward that required amendment at that point. So it's part of the substantive motion, and members will be reminded of that when they come to vote at the end of the debate. I'm, I'm obliged to you, thank you. Uh, just, just a couple of other comments. Um, uh, firstly, I'm picking up on uh, a comment made by Councillor uh, Gibson when he was uh, uh, listening to uh, Michael Gove. I, mean, I think, hopefully, we would all uh, endorse the view that uh, plan making should be more community focused. And we're all very aware uh, that in, when it comes to uh, district plans, wherever you are in the country, uh, that too often it's the developer who holds the whip hand. And we know uh, just by having to look at the Sheila, uh, the extent to which that we are held hostage. And, and I know it's not, you know, we're midway through this particular update to the district plan. But again, I hope, you know, there will be further iterations of the district plan. I do appeal uh, to officers that we rebalance uh, the discussions that we have so that we are more even-handed uh, in the way that we, you know, both, I know we have to have tough, hard negotiations with developers and we face them, uh, but equally, I think as you've, you've sensed the mood tonight, there are some tough, hard negotiations uh, that you have with communities. And if, if, if plan making is going to be treated by residents with anything other than uh, cynicism, uh, you know, we need to get into the habit of taking residents with us at an earlier stage in planned development, rather than leaving it as we do, and maybe it's, it's understandable, but rather than leaving it as we do, right at the stage of Regulation 18, where often uh, it appears to be too late. So hopefully we can take that on board uh, in part of our development process uh, in, in the future. Um, as members will know, and I'll, I'll, I, I um, 
I, I take on board the, the parable of the persistent widow uh, who brings forward uh, uh, the same cause time and time again. Uh, I'm not going to give up on making this point. But uh, you know, the jeopardy that we face as a district because uh, development, uh, other than um, places like Crabbit Park, uh, I feel really sorry for, for Councillor Gibson, um, but you know, the, propo the proportion of, of development that takes place in the south of the district and the appeal uh, that I always make, uh, and it was something that Councillor Laband picked up for Hayward Teeth at Scrutiny, is this issue Councillor about, I'm just Hayward's finishing, Thank uh, you. this issue about a spatial strategy which not only takes into account uh, where development takes place, but also <coughs> has a clear p policy of what are the limits on development. And I just point you in the direction of Sayers Common and Allbourne and ask you to roll your minds forward 10, 15, 20, 30 years and understand what Thank the risks are for that community. Um, could I ask uh, Councillor Cartwright, do you wish to speak? I too want to uh, give some uh, reasons why I, I feel more like abstaining on this plan. Uh, I, it's a cracking piece of work and a lot has gone into it. But I feel that if you look at the, the key diagram on, on page 72, um, it gives you the essence of the problem as why it is so difficult doing site selection. I mean, the, the, the top of the, of, of, of the district is basically high wheel area out, outstanding national beauty. The bottom bit is the, the, the national park. And sandwiched in the middle is the bit which provides all the housing. And going down this line, what we're doing is we're looking at the component parts all the time and not strategically at the whole. And over time, two things happen. One of which is you've put so many developments in one place, it's becoming a town. Uh, but the town itself hasn't been planned. We, we miss urban planning. It, it was something that happened in my youth and it disappeared. But we no longer have urban planning and we need it here because basically looking at this, down in the left-hand corner, this says common, and that looks like that's going to become a town sooner or later. Um, but we're not considering it in those, in those terms. We're just looking at component parts all the time. And that's my main reservation about, about this approach. Um, and I think my, my two colleagues have, have, have talked about co co coalescence. Yes, I mean, that's what I'm to talking about as well. And also the spatial gaps between the towns we've got within this sandwich band where all the development is taking place. So I'm um, very happy, by and large, with what's in, what's in the document, but not really happy that we're not taking a strategic overview of where we're going and looking at it, not only from the, from the point of view of the poor folks who actually live here, who may have different needs from what the developers want to superimpose on them for economic purposes, because Developers don't line up to, to, to build social housing as we know we do. We do need social housing and we've got to get the money somehow to do it. And also that within, within the little developments themselves in the towns, you know, it's awfully frustrating that the Section 106 money can only be used within the area that's being developed. So coming back to dear old Burgess Hill, which has rather been overshadowing tonight, uh, Northern Ark, in, in, in homes England. Actually, it was going pretty well because they, 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 they did one thing, which was to put the infrastructure in first and build afterwards. Why don't we just do that generally as, 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 a rule, as, as a rule of development? We should have the infrastructure in first and then do the development, the expansion. If we don't do that, the infrastructure is always going to lag behind. We don't know where we are on water. We don't know where we are on transport. If you look at uh, Mayfield, as it was called, say as common on, the, on this diagram, then they're rolling. You know, Council everybody there will wait. have to go that, that down to Burgess Hill, more traffic jams of the lot. So please, you know, can we actually get strategic on planning Thank and you. do some urban planning as we should be doing as a proper district council? Thank, Thank you, Councillor Cartwright. Um, I've now got Councillor DeBell. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Um, Councillor Gibson made a very good point about community <laughs> engagement, and I think that was a very valid point. And that would be wonderful, except that uh, what I constantly hear is 
uh, you can build what you like, but not where I live. Uh, and we, we could all say that. Um, the fact is that community engagement or not, we have to produce the numbers. And there are certain parties that would produce a lot more numbers than uh, the current ones, so I believe. Uh, the second thing that I so I would, I would tend to agree with Councillor Gibson, it would be wonderful if the local communities uh, themselves all came together somehow and produced the numbers. But we have to produce the numbers. And uh, if we don't, then as um, Councillor Eggleston said, uh, talking about whip hands, it would definitely be the developers. If, as uh, certain people tried to do a number of times this year, um, torpedo, if, if we torpedoed um, the district plan, then the developers really would have a free hand. And that's one of the things that these officers and these councillors have worked very, very hard to make sure does not happen. And I'm very grateful to that. Uh, I think also um, Councillor Cartwright made uh, a very good point about urban planning, but where does that come from? It has to come from us. We have to decide where these houses are going to go. Let me remind everybody, the population of the world is going through the roof. Not only is it, it, it seems to double every, every 10 years. Uh, and we have to find houses for these people. You can't have pie in the sky. They have to be produced. And this council, these officers, have done a very, very good job of producing those numbers yeah, yeah, yeah. to make sure that it remains within uh, this council and people in this, this uh, area rather than developers themselves, building willy-nilly where they like. I wouldn't want that. And I don't think the people of this, uh, this district would like that very, very much either. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeBell. Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Chairman. Just a very quick one. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything on this one, uh, but um, Councillor Cartwright made me stand up, unfortunately. Um, he, he referenced that map on page 72, and it's quite illuminating, really, because my little old ward is all in A and OB. And since I've been a councillor since 2003, we've had over 1,200 houses bumped into our, our ward, and that was because we didn't have a district plan. And at this routing committee, some people still didn't want a district plan. Mm. We had that special council meeting, and a lot of people didn't want the district plan in that one. This here is to get a district plan. Um, and you did mention about infrastructure first. Brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. We don't have seal, so we can't do that. We can implore the um, developers to do that. Uh, and actually, in my ward up in Peace Pottage, infrastructure did come in first. It was the, probably the only site that I know of. All the infrastructure was put in first, other than the shop. But they put 600 houses up there. And because they went in first, at the infrastructure, what was an absolute nightmare about traffic congestion, I'm sorry, Councillor Gibson, you haven't got the worst one. It used to be up in Pease Botted, believe me. We don't have anything up there now because they did the infrastructure. It works. So I agree with you. Infrastructure should come in first, but we can't get anything like that unless we've got a plan to get that. Mm. And once the plan is in place, we could then perhaps go to the developer and say, hey, how about putting the infrastructure in first? Because I know some of them will. Not all of them, but some of them will. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Marsh. Yes. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Chairman. All I would say is, and I'll keep it brief, there's been comments earlier, I heard earlier in this debate regarding East Grinch and the numbers it's taking. What I would say, we need to look over the last 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. where the housing sites have been allocated and built with and without a district plan, and we only have to look to August for the DPD, where there's two large sites in East Grinstead that have been, unfortunately, very difficult from a, if you're an East Grinstead councillor, being through the DPD inspection process and approved. So to suggest East Grinstead is not taking its fair share is not, is not fair over, over this last, certainly, couple of months and over 5, 10, 15 years. That's all I'll say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have no further speakers on this, so I am going to refer to Councillor Ash Edwards to speak as a seconder of the original recommendation. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I'll, I'll try and sum up um, quickly with just a few points. Um, firstly, can I thank members who've taken part in, in the process that we've had to go through on the district plan review? Um, I think it is 
important that we've been able to bring this work forward and that we've, yes, had some disagreements about uh, a few issues, but actually the broad thrust of the plan, I think, is something that uh, seems to be broadly um, supported by members. And I think that is just a contrast to many, many of our neighbouring councils who don't have a plan, who aren't able to bring forward a plan update, who don't have a five-year loan supply, who are entirely at the mercy uh, of planning by appeal and developers. And I think it is really important that we are making sure we are not being drug dragged down what can be a seductive road to just pretend it doesn't need to happen. Uh, and so I think it is important that we can move forward with the plan. As has been um, referenced, there's been a lot of work going on and some important changes made that have reflected public opinion and feedback from town and parish councils from the original draft. More brownfield sites, less greenfield sites, lower housing numbers overall for allocation. I think that is the right way uh, forward. But as I said, the consequences of not doing a review are significant. They give our communities less control over what happens locally. It makes it harder to plan infrastructure and it doesn't give us the ability we need to bring in more up-to-date policies on things such as the improved environmental standards that we all want to see. On the spatial strategy, I think that is an important point because it is a significant change uh, for the first time uh, in a very long time in planning in Mid-Sussex. But it reflects a simple reality that significant parts of our district are constrained. Councillor Peacock quite rightly highlighted this. The significant growth of parts of our district have already taken and is still being built out. And it's important that that uh, is recognised. And that does mean that the sites, the next most suitable sites, are perhaps slightly different parts uh, of the district. Uh, and I know that will bring some challenges, but it will bring some opportunities too in terms of being able to improve infrastructure. So 24 sites going forward for consultation. But I think, Chairman, we also need to just remember that means there are 236 sites being protected, sites that landowners and developers want to build on that are being protected in this plan. And that is the difference that having a plan uh, gives you and gives our communities. But it is a long process. This is the first consultation process. I think it's really important that our communities have their say. And as a council, we will be able to go away, look carefully at all of the consultation responses and make the changes that are necessary wherever possible. And a Regulation 19 version will come back uh, through next year and then go back out to consultation again. So there are plenty of opportunities uh, for the plan to evolve. And as we've seen with plans before, they do evolve um, over time. So, Chairman, I hope that members will be able to support the plan going out to consultation. I think it is a good uh, Regulation 18 plan. Uh, it will continue to evolve, uh, but I think it's really important that we are able to take that step to deliver the homes our communities need, to provide infrastructure, to get the best environmental standards we can but it, critically to ensure we do not fall victim to uncontrolled speculative development. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ash Edwards. I'm now going to finally invite Cabinet Member Councillor Sawsbury to speak as mover of the original motion. Thank you, Chairman. I have very little to add to that. Um, what I do say to people who have picked out individual parts of the plan tonight and commented on them, is that you've got to take the whole plan in the round. There may be parts of it you don't like, there are parts of it I don't like. Um, but the plan has to be taken in the round, and the opportunity tonight is to send this out to our communities where we can get the responses back. And that's the whole point of Regulation 18, and I do commend this plan to all members. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Well. Before uh, we go to the vote, I'm going to ask Jeff Wilde to read the full recommendations and explain what we're actually voting on, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. We are voting on recommendation, which is paragraph four in your pack of documents, four and is subparagraphs one, two and three. So I'll read those out. So the Council is recommended to approve the following documents for Regulation 18 consultation for a period of six weeks commencing on 7th November 2022. Uh, a, the consultation draft district plan, which is Appendix 1 and has that alteration, as you are aware, to the ninth bullet point 
on page 155 regarding the provision for allotments. B, the sustainability appraisal, which is Appendix 2, and C, the Habitats Regulations Assessment at Appendix 3. Uh, Subparagraph 2, to approve the Community <coughs> Involvement Plan at Appendix 4. And finally, little 3, to authorise the Assistant Director for Planning and Sustainable Economy in consultation with the Cabinet Member for Planning to make any necessary minor typographical and factual changes to the above documents prior to consultation. Thank you very much. So I'm going to now ask members to proceed to vote using your microphone touch screen, please. is 25 in favour, 0 against and 21 abstentions. So the motion is carried. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to item 8 on the agenda, which is the Mid-Sussex Net Zero Targets. This item is proposed by Councillor Hillier. It's uh, pages 777 to 904 on your agenda. Councillor Hillier, would you like to introduce this? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to quickly start by laying out the context, um, for, partly for members of the public listening and also to assist members during the debate. So this work began with the approval of our Sustainable Economic Strategy, the SES, a few months ago. Within that strategy, Objective 6 was to promote the benefits of sustainability practices and encourage action to support the achievement of carbon net zero. Objective 8 was to improve, manage and promote biodiversity and nature recovery. And Objective 13, to achieve a reduction in carbon emissions. So to help achieve that reduction, the SCF features an action to create a carbon reduction programme. To create that programme, the Council needs net zero targets, which is why this item is before you tonight. Members of scrutiny looked at these papers and largely gave it a very warm response and it was recommended to full council tonight with no objections. In addition, there was an excellent presentation to all members who attended on the 6th of September where I think most sensible questions were answered very satisfactorily. I would like to say that these proposed target dates are end dates. I and hopefully everyone in this chamber would like this council to proceed as quickly as reasonably possible to reduce emissions as soon as possible, as the benefits of those savings will be felt by our environment for every year they are achieved. But, as you will have heard, we are heavily reliant upon the government for getting enabling legislation through, particularly around planning, and for achieving the huge tasks of decarbonising our energy sources and transport system. This requires quantum leaps in technology, which, whilst the Conservative government has made huge strides, much is still uncertain. And we also have to balance the need for speed with keeping our services affordable to the lower income taxpayers. Some might question, why we will be probably committing resource in the future towards this when our and the UK's contribution to global warming is so small. For me, it is quite simple. We cannot effectively and honourably press the big polluting nations to do their utmost if we don't lead by example and have our own house in order. The final bits, as I alluded to when uh, answering Ms Weinstein's question earlier, is how members can play their part, assuming we agree these targets tonight. Firstly, by holding us to account as the pathways to net zero emerged and are agreed by this chamber in the next few months. 
to assist, as you will have read in the report, there will be periodic independent carbon rebaselining of both district-wide and council-only carbon emissions. So the council-only emissions will be baselined once a year. The council-only, that's what that is, the directly controlled emissions. The indirect council-only emissions will be baselined every two years and the district-wide baseline every three years. Secondly, by paying our part in scrutiny and at any time through the appropriate channels, <coughs> in devising messages and strategies to affect resident behaviour. And finally, and probably most important, again, referring back to Ms Weinstein's, by doing all we can to inform our communities about what they can do to bring them with us as enthusiastic partners on this most important of journeys. I therefore commend the recommendations in the paper to full council and look forward to hearing members' views. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hillier. This mo Motion is um, seconded by Councillor Belsey. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right? To... Um, thank you, Chairman. I'll reserve my right. Thank you. Thank you. Does any councillor wish to speak on this motion, please? I see none. So I'm going to... Oh, I have. Apologies. I have Councillor Paul Brown. You wish to speak on this item. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm referring to page 852, uh, the Accelerated Pathways to Net Zero 2040. Thinking about sustainable communities and sustainable environment aspects, which Ricardo has concluded are mitigating measures not within the Council's control. These include energy generation systems by massive increase in roof-mounted solar technologies and road transport volume reductions. So, the first, uh, the first one of these, I'd please, um, I'd like to uh, show a page from uh, the Woodgate, um, the Woodgate development at Pease Pottage, and all members have a copy of, of this uh, glossy uh, brochure. And you'll notice what the feature: there isn't a single uh, uh, photovoltaic cell on the roof of any of the houses at. At, at the Peace Pottage development. And, uh, and the reason is that their, their houses are all, are all heated by uh, gas-fired combi boilers and they have no hot water storage cylinders. So is it likely that this is, this is going to change when the new DPS2 policy replaces the ineffective existing DP39 sustainable design and construction? policy. Um, do you have confidence in uh, the, the, score, the, eight, the housing quality mark scoring system of Fabric First? Um, so moving on now to transport emissions, and that's on page 866 of the agenda, paragraph 3.3.3.2. And uh, Ricardo uh, estimating a 9% reduction of uh, use of private car use by 2030. Um, and at the moment, uh, I've seen no visible progress uh, on, uh, on the local cycling and walking infrastructure plans. And over three and a half years that I've been on this council, I've seen no, uh, I'm hoping that this might uh, start to uh, create some, uh, some movement towards active travel. Um, there's no mention and there's no integration with the idea of a 20-minute uh, town policy either, i.e. walking or cycling within 20 minutes. Um, how, will, how will this policy be embedded in the net zero targets, I ask? These opportunities are just demanding to be implemented, regardless of uh, Her Majesty's government dithering and held back by the lack of ambition of this council. And it doesn't require it doesn't require much money. It's not a point of talking to your talking to your neighbours. It needs to be done as a business exercise. Um, so I think that this report is just kicking the can down the road for another three years. So finally, my last question is about the delivery of the policy, um, and it, the timeline it indicates that this we're now going a further stage of work representing <laughs> 11,015 pounds, uh, will be presented in, in 2023. Councillor Hillier mentioned in the next two or three months. But I'd like to see some surety and some uh, when, when this report is finally going to be delivered. 
In fact, I didn't Councillor expect Brown. to be... I'm sorry, sorry, I'm I'm sorry just, to interrupt you. I'm just Are you concluding? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't even expect this. I was surprised to see this to come to Council because I thought we were really within a couple of months uh, of, of the, whole, the whole thing being wrapped up. Uh, so here we are. And thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor you. Brown. Councillor Eaves. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Councillor Hillier said earlier, global leaders, uh, we are global readers and the West of, of the world isn't <coughs> up to speed. Well, that is debatable. Lord Deben, who is chair of the Climate Change Committee, said today, our targets are excellent, but our delivery has been appalling. And I think that's true of this council as well. And in fact, even the targets aren't great because if you look at Aaron, for example, we've heard they're 2030 for their, uh, the emissions they can control. Horsham, 2030 as well. Lewis District, 2030. I appreciate there's an awful lot we can't control. And I agree that uh, because of the government we have at the moment, there are so many U-turns, it's really difficult to know uh, what, what we're dealing with. Uh, just to convey the urgency of this matter, we have missed the boat on 1.5 degrees. That's gone, basically. The warmest seven years have all been <coughs> since 2015. That's the World Meteorological Organization says that. <coughs> Temperatures in Europe, and Europe, that is us, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, have increased at more than twice the global average in the last 30 years, WMO said today. And there is no, I quote, there is no long-term prosperity without action on climate change. Rishi Sunak tweeted today. Thought you might like that one. So, but if we look at what has been happening over the last three years in this district council, very little. There hasn't been enough ambition. We've got one food waste trial which is starting and which is looking good. That's great. But it's still involving diesel lorries taking, taking the waste out of county. And uh, it's really not enough. Actions speak louder than words and certainly louder than targets. It's so easy just to set targets. So I'd like to see so many things included, which I hope we will discuss in the action plan, like car clubs, workplace parking levies, uh, the, the famous cycle path between Burgess Hill and Haywards Heath, which would be the ultimate quick fix modal shift route. The Elsie whips, why are the Elsie whips so late? Uh, E-bike and e-scooter rental schemes on district land. We need the district to buy into this. It's now called shared micro-mobility, by the way. Uh, avoiding waste in the first place, banning intensive agriculture, linking up ancient woodland, getting trees planted now because they don't produce carbon uh, for a long, long time, and not allowing the building of massive industrial buildings like we did in Bolney, that one with the barrel roof, with no solar panels on the roof. How can we do that? The warmer home scheme, all very well, but it doesn't cover double glazing. That leaves a lot of people out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, can I ask Councillor uh, Ed, Jenny Edwards, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was working with some materials from the Carbon Literacy Project this week, and one sentence that I hadn't spotted before struck me today. Um, I'll just read the sentence. Uh, the Carbon Literacy Project is based on the key aim that if we are to cut our carbon emissions by the kind of reduction targets demanded of us by science by 2050, then we will need to change the culture as well as the technology. So could we be told what measures are in place to support a culture within the council conducive to achieving a net zero strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, Councillor Dempsey. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to agree with um, Councillor Hillier uh, in what he said about the reasons why this is an important thing for us all to consider, and in particular the, for our country to consider in the scope of, of, of the global situation. And just to add, add one, um, one addition to his reasoning as to why, even though we now might be a comparatively small emitter as a nation in respect of other countries that are bigger than us, if you take the total amount of time over which we've been emitting carbon and other greenhouse gases, we've actually been a net huge contributor over the period of, of 300 years being the first country to industrialise. I've heard it described as, when, when people are talking about um, asking 
developing countries to, to do their share. I've heard it described as kind of inviting people to join you for the coffee and chocolates at the end of a meal and then expecting them to split the entire bill, which uh, isn't very fair. So I'd just like to, to add that and then raise one specific point. Um, I, I noticed and, and I understand from previous briefings why it hasn't been possible to model the land use change elements of this. Uh, it, I see on, on page 821 of our, of our pack, it has it as a kind of consistent net carbon sequestration factor, which I assume is relating to increased, um, uh, hopefully increased um, forestry and so on, that will sequester carbon. But, but that, that is an assumption. It hasn't been properly modeled, and it says on, on page 860 that it, that it hasn't been modeled. Um, so I would just like to raise that as, a, as an issue, because this one thing this council does have significant influence over is land use. And as we've been discussing this evening, land use change. And so if we are going to be doing things that will result in carbon being released from soils or from habitats, then I just would urge that as we take this forward into the future, we try to get a better handle of that. I understand why it hasn't been included so far, but I think that's something that's very important for us to consider in the future, which is it's Lulu CF in the jargon, for, uh, for, which stands for Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dempsey. Mm -hmm. Councillor Whitaker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just very briefly, I'd like to give one piece of good news for, for Councillor Eves. Um, some of the councillors were, were lucky enough to do a site visit to the Brookley East, Brookley West development by Homes England last week. And their current biodiversity and net gain um, achievement so far is 23%, and they are looking to increase that. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you, Councillor Whitaker. I have no other councillors, so I'm going to uh, refer to the um, councillor, John Bersey, who is the secondary of this item. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm very pleased to second uh, this motion. Um, I recognise this is a subject that uh, members across the chamber have got uh, views on, and I've enjoyed uh, discussing with many members across all parties in this chamber their ideas on initiatives and proposals for our council. <coughs> We've heard some comments tonight. I, I have to say I can't agree that our council hasn't... Um, been doing anything over the last three years. I think we've done a huge amount. Um, I think the councillors that said we hadn't done anything referred uh, to the food waste trial, uh, which is a great example of where we're leading within West Sussex to try to uh, improve our, uh, and are improving our recycling rates. You know, it's just not realistic to expect diesel um, lorries from Serco, as an example, to suddenly become electric. They've got their life cycle, they're all contractual. We are, as a cabinet member on that, I am working with Serco all the time, and we are looking for, you know, as those um, vehicles come out of the fleet, uh, what they will be replaced with. Uh, you know, similarly, we heard uh, with the, um, the Brookley East, Brookley West, as Councillor Whitaker has just said, some of the work uh, that's going on there. Um, the LC Whips, Local Cycling Walking Infrastructure Plan, a huge amount of work's gone in over the last 12 months. Uh, they themselves have been involving, and we will be putting forward a Mid Sussex uh, LC Whip very shortly, which will go into a wider West Sussex one, uh, and that will cover our three towns and some really key areas uh, uh, where we've consulted. Uh, with uh, the local town councils and other uh, relevant cycling groups. So I think there's a huge amount of work going on, similarly with our planning, and I know we would like to build greener uh, and cleaner homes. So um, I've spoken as well with things like rewilding, the uh, Blue Hearts Initiative. There's a lot of work that we're already doing. We've heard about the biodiversity net gain. I know we'll always struggle to agree at the pace of which uh, some of these actions should be happening. But I think if we look at the uh, recommendation before us tonight. I'd like to thank Ricardo for their work on this very important subject. And I think that the targets are split in such a way that allow us to reach net zero with emissions that the council can control, as my co colleague said, as, as quickly as, as possible with the backstop of 2040, but yet also maintain and work towards national targets where we'll have influence but are unable to control. I know all the members, as is clear uh, from the speeches, will be keen to uh, see how we can achieve our targets and strategy. And I know we'll be encouraging our residents and sort of businesses and other communities within our, our Mid-Sussex to try and uh, do what they can to reach those goals. And I'm very pleased to second this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Before we um, state the recommendations, go to vote. Councillor Hillier, do you wish to speak? Are you... 
No, fine. Then I'm going to uh, state recommendations that are being voted on for the benefit of members, viewers, and listeners. The full recommendations are on page 777. Um, item four, that the council, one, approves the following recommended net to zero targets. A, a district-wide net zero target aligned to the national target. B, a council-only net zero target of 2040 for emissions the council can directly control. And C, a council-only net zero target aligned to the national target for emissions the council can only indirectly influence. Could members please vote on this item using the microphone touch screen in front of you. Yes, could I ask you to read the result, please? Of the vote on that motion is 40 in favour, three against, and one abstention, so the motion is carried. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on uh, to item nine to receive the leader's report. Thank you very much, Sam. I will be brief as we have uh, a couple of substantive items in this room came in there three weeks ago where I gave it to our people. Um, so it's just to report that um, as part of the uh, cost of living uh, initiatives at uh, this council with others secured funding to help um, lower income residents improve energy efficiency of eligible homes as part of the Walton Homes funding, uh, which is available now until March 2023. Um, and up to £25,000 is available per home for insulation measures, um, solar PV panels and air source heat pumps. Um, if a house has an energy performance certificate rating of E, F or G and the household income is under £30,000 um, per year. Um, and that scheme is, is live now and I think it is an important way of helping um, lower income uh, residents in, in poorer insulated houses uh, to uh, improve um, the insulation and energy efficiency of properties because of course the cheapest, greenest energy is the energy we don't actually use in the first place. Um, and so I think that's a, a very good initiative and I'd encourage members to uh, promote that in their communities. Happy to take any questions, Jen. Thank you. Um, members, so that all who, who wish to do so have adequate opportunity to pose a question, could you make sure it's a question and not a statement? Thank you. Um, I have a... Ms. Councillor Henwood wishes to speak. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, you mentioned each home under an income of 30,000 a year would receive 2,500. You, uh, sorry, uh, councillor, to what would they spend this? Would they have the choice to decide which they wanted, how they wanted to spend this? Thank you. Oh, sorry, councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Actually, um, up to a maximum of £25,000 per home. Um, and, uh, and yes, there will be an assessment of what the most appropriate um, measures are. Um, and so it covers insulation, solar PV panels, or air and or air source heat pumps. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, sorry, the leader may have said it, but um, I believe that it's a, a fam a, an income of 30,000 or in receipt of a benefit. Could you just clarify that? Councillor Ash Yes, yeah, sorry, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Eggleston. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, that's... Uh, a very interesting announcement, Leader. Uh, is there some materials that will be released uh, to members and other signposting bodies so that we can get the residents and the money connected? Councillor Asher, please. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chairman. I think I'm permitted this question because it relates to business since the last meeting, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, does the leader have an update on investment zones um, since the change in Prime Minister since we last met? Thank you. That's Rashi Edwards. 
Uh, Chairman, there hasn't been a formal announcement, um, and clearly there will be, I imagine, an update from the government as part of the, the autumn statement later in this month. Um, and so we'll see uh, what uh, that brings, both for that and the uh, levelling up fund bid. Uh, and of course, it may well be that a different ministerial team wishes to uh, change priorities, um, but I'll never apologise for making the case for more investment in our district. OK, thank you very much. I have no further speakers, so I'm going to move on to item 10 to, report, to receive reports of the Cabinet members, including questions pursuant to Council Procedure Rule 10.1. Um, may I ask the Deputy Leader, Councillor John Belsey, to speak, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I hope people have seen the press release issued earlier this week, which states that so far we've collected over 29 tonnes of food waste in the first four weeks of our food waste trial. I'm very grateful to all the residents who've participated in the trial. Uh, just as interesting that so far the amount of weight being collected each week has initially been about the same. Um, I think we had thought it might start to dip, but it hasn't yet. But feedback um, it seems to be very positive, both in the Facebook group and Facebook group anecdotally uh, through uh, uh, responses to the council. And I know some people who had fears and scepticism about whether it would be a success with the black bins only every three weeks, etc., have uh, changed their minds. So I'm hopeful that as the feedback grows on this trial and it um, uh, it, it, it continues uh, that we are able to see uh, ongoing success in respect to the trial. Last month, I updated the Council on the Centre for Outdoor Sports. A work continues on that, um, and we've sent the survey now to the local sports clubs that we hadn't already met in person. You'll also may recall that I mentioned about the athletics track and the meeting potential with England Athletics. That meeting has now happened with the running clubs at the Haywards Heath and Burgess Hill, uh, with officers myself and England Athletics. Uh, England Athletics confirmed right at the beginning of the meeting that they do not support any new 400 metre tracks in England unless they are direct replacements. However, they would support a running loop around the Centre for Outdoor Sports, and we are looking at this possibly to include a measured straight. So, for example, so you could do sprint work, the 60 metres, 100 metres, etc. Uh, so we're looking at that as part of the wider measured loop, so it could support sprint and long distance running. We also agreed to work with the running clubs and England Athletics and West Sussex to seek to maximise facilities at an appropriate local school. Now, England Athletics themselves do not have any funding to bring to a project, so we will have to work with partners to see what might be possible from various funding sources and what facilities are of most need. So I will keep Council updated as that progresses, both in terms of the athletics potential facility, but also in terms of the very exciting project that we have to help our sporting uh, communities flourish across uh, Mid-Sussex, but based out of the centre in Burgess Hill. And just finally to say, uh, both the consultations for Hemley's Meadow and Finch's Field in Peace Pottage and for Holland's Way in East Grinstead have now occurred. Both were well attended by members of the public and we look forward to seeing the final schemes. Just like to say in particular the East Grinstead scheme with the Holland's Way playground will now of course be next to the home of the Quarry Cafe uh, as that moves into the old post office site that Mid Sussex has now leased to the Quarry Cafe. And I think that will be a really exciting scheme creating valuable and fresh community space in East Grinstead. And I would just also finish by saying um, that it was really exciting at the weekend in my um, community liaison role with the organisations to be able to work a new bonfire society into Mid-Sussex. And we had um, well over 2,000 people attend the first ever torchlit procession with amazing uh, pyrotechnics and bonfire in Ashurst Wood. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it, it was really great to see how, how well received that's been by the community. And um, I, clearly uh, there's a huge appetite for community events such as that. And it was lovely to have a free event uh, in particular with this uh, challenging times with the cost of living challenges that we all face. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Belsey. Um, I have no questions for you, so I'm going to move on to... <laughs> I was jumping too quickly. I do apologise. Councillor Rex Whittaker. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Just a brief one. Um, I was with the Burgess Hill Rugby uh, Club um, players and management on Saturday when East Greenston 
beat them fairly soundly, but they wanted to pass on their comments when I was discussing the Centre for Outdoor Sport. So just to let officers know and uh, Councillor Belsey and others that they are still very keen to be involved in uh, with uh, discussions on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitaker. Councillor Ian Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, 29 tonnes of food waste uh, sounds a very impressive figure. To, in, in, I hope it's not 29 tonnes of wasted food. Um, have you actually benchmarked it against other districts which have introduced this, this, this kind of trial in order to know whether or not we're particularly wasteful? Councillor Belsey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it's wasted food or not. I, I know there are some pretty gruesome photographs of what the 29 tonnes of food waste looks like. So uh, I, I, if you want to um, have a little investigation, I'd be pleased to arrange that for you. But um, I will make sure that with officers I feedback at the next meeting, but perhaps as we've got a bit more statistics as to how that compares. Thank you. Councillor Bates. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very interesting to hear about the uh, athletics track, or not. Um, I've been on this subject for many years through my running career still going. I don't think I'll be running around a track now, but I welcome the idea of trying to get some running facility. Um, in particular, there is um, a project that's been going for quite a few now, years now, and that's the Park Run series, and one of them is in Clare Park in Haverseaf. That's the only one in Mid-Sussex. It's not very good, and I wondered if we could try and improve that path around there. It happens on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. Um, I'd welcome a similar one in Burgess Hill, if it was possible. I mean, it's supposed to be one lap for five kilometres, but we end up in Clare Park, four and a half laps, which means a lot of lapping of runners, people like myself. <laughs> um, and there's hills there, it's not ideal. But so that's one thing I would ask the council to look at try and improve, improve Clare Park, see what we can do in Burgess Hill. Um, but in terms of the athletics, I would like to see the council try and engage with the, the local running groups, which are basically Hayward Seat and Burgess Hill, to um, facilitate them being able to use the tracks that are available. I could go to three tracks from here and the fourth one, if it was built in Burgess Hill, is not that further away. I mean, so I think we should try and facilitate these running groups to go and use these other tracks. And I know that I think Burgess Hill definitely do a, a weekly session or something. And Hayward Heath have to hire the off the Crawley track to put on a suitable meeting once a year. So I would like to see the district council be more proactive in supporting the use of these other tracks by busing people there or whatever. Um, so I, I'm glad that it's under discussion and pity we can't have a track in Mid-Sussex, but I understand the situation. Thank you, Councillor Bates. Councillor Belsey, do you have to reply? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think, and I think Councillor Bates sums it up, the fact that there are three other tracks or possibly a fourth one that are actually not too far away, which is part of the reason why uh, it wouldn't be very sustainable to, or wouldn't be sustainable to have to have one um, right in the heart of Mid-Sussex. And if we did have one, I think the other tracks would suffer immensely. My understanding is they do use those tracks uh, qu quite regularly. Um, I would, uh, but, but hopefully the running loop, for example, might help from the sprinting and there are other, other benefits from that, as well as a safe space for people to be able to run. It would be lit and it would have, um, uh, you know, be able to be coped with winter evenings, etc. Uh, what I would say is that, of course, there was a park run in East Grinstead as well, Councillor Bates, and it's a very successful park run, and I think they've got over 100 volunteers in their books. I think park run are always open to uh, new events being opened, and I'm sure if, uh, if there was the appetite to do so, they would welcome um, some volunteers to come forward from Burgess Hill. I'm sure the council would do what they could to support that uh, if it was on Mid-Sussex district land, as they have done with the East Grinstead and uh, Haywards Heath sites. So I, I, I think that we do need um, 
rather than the council do it, it will need uh, some volunteers to come forward to make that happen. But happy to take offline any specific comments that Councillor Bates would wish to follow up with. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Belsey. I'm going to move on now to um, the Cabinet Member for Economic Growth and Net Zero, Councillor Hillier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. We're glad to hear I gave quite a long report last full council. The officers and myself have been incredibly busy. I've got nothing new I need to bring to the chamber, but I'm looking forward to the opportunity for beating East Grinstead Hockey Club at the weekend. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm now going to move on. I have no questions for Councillor Hillier to the Cabinet Member for Community, Councillor Webster. Thank you, Chairman. I, I missed the last couple of meetings because, first of all, I was ill and then I was on holiday because the meeting was rescheduled because of the death of Her Majesty. So I'm afraid I do have a little bit more to say. But what I do want to start off with is by saying that we have about a 94% um, submission rate for the annual electoral canvas which is a very, very good result for this time of year. So we are very grateful to those people in the district, the residents who have responded to that. And following the electoral review of Mid-Sussex, the parliamentary order was made in Parliament on the 14th of July, and it came into effect on the 15th of October. Um, our electoral services have created the necessary maps prepared and checked the electoral roll, the polling districts, etc., and they are fully prepared for final submission of the new roll to government by the end of this month. Our local land charges registry data was migrated to His Majesty's land registry on the, well, it was Her Majesty's land registry on the 21st of March and searches to enable property completions, etc., are now via a self-service online portal, so search results are instant. I'm very pleased to report that the legal practice of the Council has again been assessed and awarded the excellence in legal practice management and client care mark from the Law Society. Chairman, I can't think of a finer platform on which Tom Clark has retired after his 15 years of service, and I would like to welcome Louise Duffield and say how um, keen I am to get working with her on all sorts of things going forward. Um, members will have seen details of the grants which were awarded at the October meeting of the Cabinet Grants Panel in a recent MIS publication, so I won't list them again, but I do want to recognise the very significant work that this Council has done in providing both community and corporate grants to the various communities of Mid-Sussex. And having said that I'm not going to list them, I'm going to mention a couple um, one was to um, foresight vision support to fund the production of newsletters in an accessible format, and that was for £1,716, and £9,500 from the Community Grants Fund is awarded to the Career Support West Sussex to fund a project to identify and engage with male carers in Mid-Sussex. There's a micro-business grant to fund the purchase of staff training and registration for solar panel ins insulations. Um, and there are two sets of funding that have been given to support the hiring of apprentices. And I do want to just mention that there is a a warmer homes video that has gone out on the council um, social media and there was also a press release issued on the 28th of October um, that is available on the website which has um, all the details as well. 
And as more social prescribers are being appointed across the district, our well-being team is receiving a greater number of inward referrals and the improved health of their clients is very significant indeed. Chairman, I do want to touch on antisocial behaviour and I've said in this chamber before that it will not be tolerated in Mid-Sussex and we will use all powers at our disposal <coughs> to prevent it. <coughs> and the public space protection order for car cruising I was about to get up and start dancing for the first time in 20 years. The public space protection order for car cruising is set to expire in April next year, and officers will be undertaking further work, including consultation, to include Jobs Lane and the A2300, where there has been some antisocial car cruising, wheel <coughs> spinning, and racing and so on in recent months. The air quality management area annual report was discussed at our recent annual meeting and I'm pleased that the good results continue, although you might expect trends will be carefully watched going forward. And I want to thank Councillor Hatton and Councillor Lord from West Sussex County Council for their constructive engagement in the process as usual. Thank you. The environmental team remain busy and have seen an upward trend in site visits over the last four months. 460 visits, then 492, followed by 550, and then 660. And Chairman, this being November, there are 20 remembrance services taking place throughout the district, and at each one, a district councillor will be laying a wreath on behalf of Mid-Sussex members and officers. Chairman, I'll end on that note, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, councillor Samantha Smith, Sam Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Um, is the Cabinet member aware of the rise in antisocial behaviour in our playgrounds, uh, such as World's End and um, St John's Park in Burgess Hill, uh, plus the car parks also at Cypress Road? Uh, I have witnessed myself this behaviour, and to be honest, it's made me feel very vulnerable when walking to my car and I know others have felt the same way too. Um, there are also signs of drug use in the area. I would welcome more CCTV in the area or anything to help the situation from becoming worse. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Webster. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Smith. Yes, I am aware of that antisocial behaviour particularly in the car park, as you mentioned. And um, I am told that there is a significant smell that is recognisable um, as um, cannabis, and it is being <coughs> smoked in that area. The police are aware of it. And um, the use of CCTV is always important. And the community safety subgroup of the Mid-Sussex Partnership Board have been um, um, allocated some funding by this council. And of course, the uh, Mid-Sussex Partnership Board is also supported by the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, but they've been allocated some funding to provide two mobile CCTV systems, which can be used in the sorts of places that you mentioned. Thank you very much, Councillor Webster. Councillor Stockwell. Thank you, Chairman. And I'm grateful to the Cabinet Member for um, reminding us that, yes, this month it's, um, it's remembrance. And I'm very grateful for all of the um, members here who will be representing us at their local churches uh, also, and, and services throughout the district. And I'd also like to thank the officer, Alison, 
for coordinating it all for me, so thank you very much. Um, while we're on the subject of, of veterans, I hope you've all seen within the MIS bulletin number 43 that um, be live for 12 weeks, giving ex-UK armed forces personnel and their families the opportunity to provide direct feedback to the government on their experiences, access to and use of services for veterans. The responses to the survey will help the government better understand the experiences, needs and well-being of the veteran community and to guide future action. The government is looking for a wide range of views and would like to encourage as many ex-UK Armed Forces veterans and their families to share feedback. All councils are being encouraged to share the link, which is actually on the um, MIS, um, and allow and share it with, with their, their contacts locally, with their um, residents, um, and they can complete the, um, the survey link, which is, again, within the MIS. If anybody wants it, I'm sure we can get it out to you. Thank you. And while we're on the question of, of veterans, I'm sure you'll agree with me that this is a really difficult time for a lot of people um, looking for help um, in the current situation over needs. And the uh, Royal British Legion have um, brought forward an everyday needs grant. Grants are available for up to £240 over 12 months. And it is designed to, to assist people who need help in quick and easy ways for essentials like kitchen appliances, clothes and energy costs. It's applicable to, re uh, to recipients including serving and ex-serving personnel and the wider armed forces community, including families, dependents and carers. And, though, and it's aimed at those in receipt of means-tested state benefits, universal credit, pension credit, income support. Uh, they should automatically qualify. However, anybody who is struggling but doesn't come under that particular um, support um, should apply because there are still means testers and they, they may still be applicable. So any member of the armed forces community wanting access to the grant can find out more by applying to Royal British Legion rbl.org.uk forward slash cost of living. So I um, hope you'll find that very useful and we'll be able to pass it all on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor um, Stockwell. I'm not sure that there was a question there, but it was a worthy <laughs> statement that I'm sure <laughs> on this occasion we'll we let it go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to... Oh, uh, sorry, Councillor Cornish. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you, uh, Councillor Webster, for raising the issue of antisocial behaviour in the, in the district, and to Councillor Smith as well for raising the issues at World's, World's End. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, if Councillor Webster is aware of any uh, force or um, a police force or other means whereby um, cars are photographed for excessive noise, because at World's End um, in Burgess Hill, the there's a huge problem with uh, racers backfiring cars under bridges, not just in World's End, actually, in, in lots of places. I just wondered if you're aware of any other districts or places that have a capacity to deal with that, because although we're directing people to um, the, the website to, to log those incidents, quite often it's in the middle of the night and you can't log a registration plate, um, and we're just a bit stuck of what we can do with that. Thank you. That's for Webster. Very good question, actually, and it is something that I've raised at the police and crime scrutiny panel meetings in the past. Um, and what I would say is that there is CCTV in all three towns, and um, if residents could just note the date and the time of the occurrence so that they've got something to give to the police, because the police will not just spend hours looking through footage. Um, they do need to um, have a specific sort of time and date so that they can um, um, establish 
vehicle registrations and so on. And obviously descriptions help as well. And I will look into the issue of um, processes to photograph um, naughty drivers. Thank you, Councillor Webster. Councillor Bradbury. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Chairman, I'd, I'd like, if I may, to return to the subject of veterans and service leavers. Uh, uh, and in doing so, I think I'd better uh, declare uh, two interests. One as Chairman of West Sussex County Council, uh, and secondly as Chairman of the Building Heroes Charity. Are you going um, to ask a question, Councillor Bradbury? I am going to ask a question. I'm just declaring an interest first. Thank you. Un that's fine. If that's all right, Chairman. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so the, the question I've got is... It, uh, um, Councillor Webbs, I'm sure will be aware that West Sussex County Council has achieved the uh, gold standard in respect of the employer recognition scheme of SERFCA. Uh, this council languishes on the bronze level and has done for a number of years. And I wonder if Councillor Webster has any plans to improve that situation. Thank you. I Thank believe you. that's a question, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Webster. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Webster. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. And, and just in response to Councillor Stockwell's question, which was, did I agree? Yes, I did agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I do agree that the, um, bron the, the bronze, silver and gold rankings are very important, and it is important that we do the best that we possibly can. Some of the requirements are beyond our pay grade and they are not possible for us to achieve, but others could be improved upon and I, I would encourage officers to look at where we can improve our su support to veterans. And of course, part of that um, support comes through the citizens' advice um, grant that we give. We provide a very substantial amount of money for a, a small district council and also Mid-Sussex Voluntary Action and of course the Age UKs that we support as well. And whilst Councillor Stockwell was speaking, I did think that I should have mentioned the recently updated community di directory that is on the website and hard copies are available and um, there is a leaflet that's just gone out in MIS um, on support that's available over the winter for residents who are finding things a bit hard and who need a helping hand. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Webster. I am now going to move on to the Cabinet Member for Leisure and Parking, Councillor Demir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, see. And I bet you missed me at the last council, but my apologies <coughs> that I wasn't here either. So good evening, and very, very brief, because I know time is ticking on. So I just want to report that our three leisure centres are continuing to increase the number of visits they're having and membership. So that's good news at the end of the evening. Um, in August, attendance was 93% of 2019 levels. And as at the end of September, which is the figures we've just received, we had over, well over, of 700,000 visits. So that puts us really well on target to achieve our aim of a million. So well done to everyone. However, the downside is, as we all know in our own homes and offices, that the utility expenditure continues to rise and it's significantly impacting the overall financial position. Um, Places for leisure are about to start installing PV panels at the Triangle and then also LED replacements across all three 
of our centres. Uh, as those of you on scrutiny are aware, a detailed report summarising performance is coming to scrutiny in November, so there'll be a lot more detail for you to chew over or whatever you do at scrutiny. Um, our car park related income, as, as I think a lot of you know, is still significantly lower than 2019. But post-COVID has been much better than we ever expected or forecast. So again, that's good news. And our an annual update on our parking strategy, as you know, is coming to scrutiny early part of 2023. Um, on the EV charging points, we now have 36 across active across the district, with those in Queensway in East Grinstead are, are completed and they'll be live by the end of the week. The Cypress Road ones in Burgess Hill have had a bit of a blip because <coughs> they've had technical issues, but again, we're hoping that there'll be good news for that very soon. And then further installations are planned for Mount Noddy and in East Grinstead and for the Wilderness Car Park in Linfield. But as part of the initial on-street phase of our charge point network, a proposal has been made to install new public charge points across the district Places, for example, like Turner's Hill, Burgess Hill, Hayward's Heath, Hassox, which is really going to begin to support our council's ambition for a really greener future. Uh, these proposals will go to formal consultation on the 10th of November, and it will end on the 1st of December. And finally, I am hoping you've all seen and have signed up for our Mid-Sussex Marathon, which is the 29th of April to the 1st of May next year. And I expect to see you all coming across the finish line. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Councillor Tamir. Uh, Councillor Anthea Lee. Um, thank you, Demir, um, Councillor Demir, for that report. Can I just ask if you know what the take-up of or the usage of the um, EV charging points is? Because I've seen often in, um, we have four in the car park in Linfield, and often those spaces are empty. Councillor De Beer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lee. Um, we do have um, various pieces of data, which I'm very happy to share with you. Do you want me to do this now, or would you prefer me to do that? Because there's rather a lot of data. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Councillor De Mere. Councillor Janice Hembridge, please. Two questions, please. Uh, you mentioned putting uh, photovoltaics on the triangle, I believe. Uh, you mentioned putting photovoltaics on the triangle. I'm wondering who's paying for this. And my second question is EV charging points are lovely. Electricity has to come from somewhere. Are there any plans for the District Council to sponsor a photovoltaic solar farm on some of their land? Thank you. Councillor Demir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the PV panels are being paid for by places for leisure because of CAPEX. So they've got all that sorted and have the funding. Uh, regarding your question, your suggestion of an electricity farm, uh, that is certainly something that I will look at and talk to officers about. So the answer is, I don't know. Can I come back to you on that? Thank you, Councillor Demir. Councillor Bates. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a quick one, actually, the last item you mentioned about the marathon next year in Hayward Seaf, we have a 10 mile course, two laps. And it has been mooted by a lot of people, if we, people like myself, really aged people, 
if we could just have a one lap race, please. So if you could possibly follow that up, I'd appreciate it. But um, the... Um, so I don't know if any other members are going to join in. But, um, no, the point I was going to raise was the, the dolphin. It, it is a well-used site. I use it. Uh, and I, I hope it will be retained. Um, the only comment I would make is, having come from a home where I can't afford to run heating, I walked into the um, dolphin today, and I was like hit by a wave of heat. I know it's a very difficult building to, to heat um, throughout, but if we could possibly you know, look at that and see if we can reduce that heating cost by some sophisticated heating system now, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Bates. Do you wish to... No. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bates. Um, yes, it always seems jolly cold to me when I go in, but um, thank you for your suggestions. Um, may I just finally say to Councillor Bates, the great news is that the Haywards Heath bike ride is celebrating its 10th anniversary next May, so we'll see you then as well. Thank you, Councillor Demir. I have no further questions. I'm going to move on to the Cabinet Member for Planning. I know we've heard from you, Councillor Salisbury. Would you have a report? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, on the operational side of planning, which is development management, I gave a report at the last meeting, uh, and the, I just say that the performance continues at that level. If I notice in the room, the very mention of a marathon has just drained my energy levels <laughs> to a severe extent. And I notice that there are other faces around the room who look the same. So I'll just comment, Chairman, that in the two hours and 40 minutes that we've been in this chamber, one hour and 40 minutes has been spent on strategic planning matters, which is the district plan. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to our last Cabinet member, but not least, the Cabinet member for Housing and Customer Services, Councillor Cromie. Hi, I will keep this brief. Um, I gave quite a long um, presentation last time. Um, in my uh, report last uh, few weeks ago, I was asked about homeless veterans uh, by Councillor Stockwell, so I do have a response on that. There are currently no homeless people who have links to the armed forces or currently veterans. We do track that information. So um, I can add that into my report as we move forward. Um, I also spoke about the Turning Tides bus that was going through East Grinstead and Haywards Heath um, and Burgess Hill. If you go on to the Haywards Heath, uh, sorry, the uh, Mid-Sussex Council Facebook page, you'll see the poster there with all of the details. So please go on there and share that. And that brings me on to my next point, which is going back to comms. We get quite a lot of um, questions from some of the members about, are you going to be sharing this? Is there going to be a press release? Um, you get the press releases, but I don't think the councillors get enough information about when things go online, particularly where it, it, it matters to you to signpost your residence. So we're going to be trialling sending out the links directly to you where it's something of importance. So it just makes it easy. You don't have to find it. You'll get an email with the link and then you can share it. Um, and then a shameless plug, just the end of the night, Haywards Heath Town Council are running a coat exchange at the moment. They're happily taking donations. Um, we've got a huge room full of coats already, all shapes and sizes, from all age groups. If anyone has a coat, please take it over the road. They'll love it. And um, please do spread the word. If, if anyone is in need of some warmth and they need a coat, they have some really, really good coats um, in, in the town hall. So please do um, signpost people to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cromie. I have no questions for <laughs> Councillor Cromie, so I'm going to move on to item 11, motions on notice. Um, I understand the motion is being withdrawn by Councillor Bennett. Can I invite Councillor Bennett to confirm your consent that this is being withdrawn? Um, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I intend to withdraw the motion. Uh, given that there's been a change of Prime Minister and seemingly a change of policy. Um, however, I do reserve the right to bring the motion back, should that change at some point in the future. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I'm going to invite the council to consent. Is that agreed? agreed. Item 12, questions from members pursuant to council procedure rule 10.2. I have none. <laughs> I didn't want to precipitate at someone <laughs> wanting to raise a question. So in that case, I'm going to close the meeting at 9.44 p.m. And thank you all for um, your attendance. And would you, could I just ask you to remain in place until the live stream has ended? <laughs>